this is years and years ago. I would see people with training partners, like, you know, trainers, basically. Not not so much like a, like a workout buddy, mm. but people getting trained, like, okay, this many reps. Right. You know, a little bit lower, a little bit higher. And I don't know what it was, but I felt that it was, um, like, I felt better than them. Like, oh, pff, I don't need this. Sure. I'm good. Like, I know what I'm doing, right. which I didn't. I had no idea. But then I went on a phase where I... All the time, I hired trainers. Like one of my trainers at Equinox, Robin. I mean, she trained me so well. She was like a top trainer and she was a vegan. And I was doing vegan diet in Toronto at that time. So not only was she helping me with my diet, but she was like such a good trainer. But in your experience, is it the actual expertise that they have or is it accountability? It's 100% accountability. It's that like I have an appointment and I need to to be there. I can't let them down. And, you know, I just get a full, complete workout, which uh, at that time on my own, like I said, I just was not enjoying training. It was just like a, a sad situation for me. It was just depressing. It was just kind of a reminder of how far I'd let myself fall off. Um, so just having having that accountability, I mean, they, they don't really, the, the boxing trainer definitely trains me. He's, sh he's showing me how to punch and all the combos, but the gym trainer, we, we work out together. You know, he decides what we do. He instructs me, you know, like he pays attention to me in that way, like a trainer, but you know, I've, I've been working out for years, so I know everything for the most part. It's more just like having a, having a friend to make it fun. The fun thing is super interesting because there have been times when the workout I was doing was very instructed, right? It's like, do this, do this with a trainer or like following an online course, okay. right? And then I went through a phase in my life where I became creative. Everything I was doing was just, I created, right? Or like a certain movement routines where I would balance on one hand, on one, you know, my big toe on the left foot, and then I would turn my body this way and that way. And for me, as long as you do that without injury and with the proper form and you're like mindful, that, that suits me the most. This I know for a fact, right? Is that because you got to know your body really well and you had such a strong foundation in your knowledge of all the different movements that you were able to experiment and have fun with it? It's more that too, but it's more that I like to not be in my head during training, right? So if if I'm following something, I'm thinking, right? Like I'll give you a simple example. On our afro -D Nation, you know, the Facebook group that we have, um, I'm posting whenever I do breath work, you know, Wim Hof or I do cold plunge, right? Like at Jungle Gym. And one guy recently asked in a comment, a doc, are you doing, uh, how many seconds do you, hold for the four rounds of Wim Hof, right? Or or how many breaths do you do per round? And you're like, I and, don't, I feel it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? And and it's like, um, man, it's such a hassle when you have to count stuff. Mm, right. For me, yes. I'm only talking for me. Like counting calories, ca it just kind of takes the love or the play out of life. Sure. 100%. I mean, I think I've always identified that when it comes to counting reps. I just like get a weight that feels good and just go until I'm like, all right, this is the last two reps or so. I'm not actually counting them. Or if I do count them, it's almost like meditation. You know, when you're just being aware mm -hmm. of your inhale and your exhale is just something to bring my attention to. Mm. Well, one thing I've done now differently with inhales and exhales, just in the last maybe month and a half, so I, I saw a podcast with James Nestor. He's the guy who wrote the book Breath. I have it on my shelf. Um, haven't gotten to it yet, but I will. And his, he's, a, he's a journalist, basically. He's not like a scientist or therapist or anything. But he wanted to know why do free divers have this ability to you know, hold their breath for so long and they're so tough. So he, he wanted to go on this exploration of how do you, how, how should we breathe? Is it, is, is nasal breathing better? Is mouth breathing better, better? Inhale, exhale, like holding it, doing it slow or fast. 
what's optimal. And one of the outcomes of his research is like a three year, he went to all the experts. He went to like the Himalayas and, you know, interviewed gurus and those like- uh, Like Wim Hof. Right, right. Uh, but he he took it more from like an Eastern perspective, the yoga, okay. swamis, and though you know, with guys with the big beards who who look like me but different, uh, a little darker than me. But um, so so he so he did that, and one of the conclusions of this book and his podcast is that nasal breathing slowly, as much as you can, is how all of this ancient tradition ancient traditions have evolved. So like removing breathing exercises, just in general, breathing day to day, whatever you're doing, whether you're cooking, working out, et cetera, slowly and nasal only. But not removing the breathwork exercises because uh, one of the things he talked about was holotropic breathing. And he did, it so, so basically what he was talking about is there are hour long sessions of breathwork one hour long, and some are even longer, like three hours long. And and you're doing, it, it's like a very melodious breathing. So you'll start off with very fast, and then it'll become medium, and then it'll become really slow. And you keep, and, and there's an instructor there, there teaching you the whole time. And he said, after this holotropic session, he felt high. Sure. It was like a psychedelic experience. So he loves breath work. He loves Wim Hof and all this. Would but... you have the patience to do like an hour or two yes. hours? Yes. What about the... With the group there. With the group. What about the instruction? Because the challenge I've had with breath work classes and so on, because I always feel better when I do them. It's kind of like yoga. Like I don't really want to do it, but if I do, I feel better after. But the challenge I often have is that kind of like what you're saying, like do this and then like keeping pace. I find like I'm thinking too much. I'd almost mm -hmm. rather just go with how I feel and maybe like, okay, now go faster, now go slower. But like literally just trying to keep pace with a very specific tempo. Um, I find that exhausting. <laughs> cause you're, cause breath is in the body. And if you're listening, then you're here mm -hmm. rather than in, in the body, yeah. something like that. I, so the way I would do it is I would attend a couple of classes, learn, and then do it on my own. Mm. Right. Same thing with Wim Hof. I, I took his course. I did first week, second week, third week. So, okay, I got it. I don't need to do this. I got it. Now I'm on my own. Because I would rather discover rather than have a bias Right? Discover different types of breathing as opposed yeah. to having them dictated to you. Yeah. Or even movements. So like at Jungle Gym, every day we're doing breath work in front of the tree. And uh, sometimes what I do is I lie down on my back and I do exteroception. So I'm staring at something like a little spot on a leaf or some some bug or whatever, right? And I'm staring and because I, I learned this from Andrew Huberman. Have you been watching? Okay. Yeah. So his meditation uh, lecture, he talked about interoception, extraoception. Interoception is when you close your eyes and you meditate, right? You're going in. Extraoception is like you're staring at a, a small point on earth, like in the external environment, and you're meditating on that. You're not moving your gaze anywhere, right? You're aware of the external environment. And he said that if you are naturally inner person, right? Like the 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 environment is not what dictates your thoughts you're more inward seeking then shift your meditation extraception meaning a word yeah okay. like staring at something but if you it's are hard. it's something you're not accustomed to that's it that's it but if you're very like aware of the external environment then close your eyes and go inward so it's this play of breath work Right, sometimes laying down on my back. Sometimes I'm, you know, the crisscross applesauce mm. <laughs> position. Right. Um, sometimes I'm standing. Sometimes I'm walking on the gravel. This is something I learned from my trainer in Austin, Sumer. So I, so my my toes, my my big toe is not as separated as I would like. 
okay. right? Because it's you don't uh, have that splay that you'd like. I don't have it, like the baby splay, right? Like the babies have, right. you know, they have like this. Yeah, it's uh, you know, it's it's a, it's a little bit of a bunion. Is that from on. wearing tight shoes or just naturally? Okay, it could be both. Could be both. So uh, one thing he recommended is gravel walks, because the grab onto the ground. That's it. So um, yeah, I've been doing a lot of foot work. Like today at Jungle Gym, I spent half an hour just doing foot, just you know, going like this with the toes. Pulling, I, I pulled the 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 toes apart like that, and doing lifts, lifts of the toe. Yeah. So, so no weight, no like towel or band. Or no, no, not needed. Because what I do is, but band, yes, I tied the band on both thumb, both uh, both uh, big toes, and I drag the big toe so they're apart, and then with resistance, I'm lifting up. Wow, that is a new level of hyper specific targeted training. Um, speaking of Huberman, he was just on the Tim Ferriss podcast. Great, great episode. And he brought to my attention the, the tibias, the working out the tibs, which is, uh, of course, the other side of your calf, which um, apparently just helps alignment your whole posture. And for him, yield is like lower back uh, problems. So I've been working on that, feeling like, okay, this is very targeted. But you just took it to a new level. <laughs> but this is a great point because when I went to see Sumer in Austin, one thing he told me is like, if you, if you just feel the the lining near the tibia, and you just remove the, you, you release the fascia around that area, right? So you know, scraping, you can use like the, massaging it, massaging it, okay. right? But but it's not just because massaging won't do it by itself. You have to take a gua sha blade. And you have to scrape the area and get it loose first. And then you're dragging the skin down. The, the right. blade is like a little plastic. Yeah, I'll show it to you after. You I'll show it to you after. Scraping, not the skin, like a scraping motion, but yeah. you're kind of like pushing into the yeah, muscle. Yeah, and it fucking hurts. Bro. <laughs> okay, it hurts, man. Because the fascia that is on our bodies is so tight and especially like under our feet, there's a lot of fascia there, man. It's so tight that you're like walking and instead of using the bottom of your feet, which you're supposed to when you're walking, right? What happens is we don't use that and the pressure builds up to the knee, to the hip, to the shoulder, right? So if you can optimize the feet and get that shit working. Starting with the feet. Man, it's a new level. It's a new level. Where do you stand on like a vibrating re recovery balls and rollers and things like the Theragun? Is that Ooh. in addition to scraping? Is that comparable in any way? I asked Sumer this. He says no. Theragun won't do it. It's it's not going to hurt because a lot of his clients. So Sumer's clients are pro play. Pro, okay, let me let me ask you if you know this guy. You're are you about you're a basketball guy? Yes. Katino Mobley. Uh, I've heard of him. Yeah. Okay. He used to be a Houston Rockets player. Oh, okay. Back way, in the day. Way, way back. Yeah, yeah. He was like a sh showboating guy. Right. Katino Mobley. So Katino Mobley and Sumer are working together. So he went to he went to see Katino like a couple of months ago in, in uh, LA. And Katino Mobley is now older yeah. and just staying in shape. But he he's playing in the, you know, those, uh, not NBA, but those. Uh, Italian league? Or? No, no, no. In, in America. But he's playing in the like in the older e league, league, something. Oh, okay. That that stuff. Yeah. So he still wants to compete and you know destroy people. <laughs> <laughs> Who doesn't? So, yeah, yeah, man. So Sumer is, um, and he he's training um, Olympic athletes, you know, track and field, uh, long jump, like these you know these types, and uh, some of these guys take Afro D as well. So I I know them personally, and Sumer's entire routine or his entire game is bone alignment. Bone alignment. Bone alignment. So I've been working out with or working out with his course and his, you know, one-on-one -on -one with him for about four or five years-ish. But four or five years, even in, when I was in Kiev, I was working out with him, like, you know, online. And with Sumer, it's, it's very much evolved, right? So he always had the bone alignment mentality. But now he's made it structured. 
right? So there's a 12 month course. What's, what's the top line overview of bone alignment? It sounds self-explanatory, but so, in my mind, bones are bones. Like, can you move them? Can you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So for example, imagine, uh, let's look at the tibia, for example, right? So what happens in most people, your foot is shifted laterally. Like a little outward? A little outward. So like, for example, my mom. My mom, when she, before she started training with Sumer, her, I mean, I still remember what, I took a couple of photos. It was just really weird. Her foot was like that way. Her, her, her tibia was shifted that way. And this tibia was shifted this way. So she was walking like this. Like a duck. <laughs> the duck walk. <laughs> and and what, what, what you want to happen through bone alignment is you want to shift the tibia medial, medial. And and what and you'll notice this what what you when you sh when you take your own hands you put it around your your leg your calf and you go like this your big toe automatically presses on the ground. Okay. Because the whole structure is such that your your big toe will get activated when you do this movement, right. and it'll like push on the ground. Okay. And his thesis is one of his his. His takeaways is strengthen your big toe. Strengthen your big toe. Hmm. Strength. And because even like uh, when I was doing Muay Thai, for example, my coach in Ulis, he has, he has so many problems, man. He would be injured every two weeks, couldn't come to class, massive pain, was taking Xanax every day, like just morphine. And he was just like on drugs for his pain. And Sumer talked to him on, on uh, you know, did a, did, a, did a call with him. And right away, he told me, he's like, dude, this guy, his alignment is not proper. And he's been training Muay Thai with the wrong form for 30 the years. The coach. The coach. For 30 years. Right away, he saw it. He's like, look, okay, his hip is like this, pelvic tilt here. So it's like, and, and, and you asked a good question, how to align the bones. So you can take floss bands and tie it around your feet. You can tie it around your calf. You can tie it around your, your thigh. And with time, the bones get aligned. With tying the band? No, time, time. Yeah, yeah. and then just having these bands tied around your then calf you train. walking around? You train. You train on it. So one training we do is you take a slant board, right? And, and you take the, your both big toes and you put it on the slant board while your bones are shifted inward. I'll show you these videos. I've, I've done so many of them okay. for years now. Yeah. So you, you, you shift them that way and you are training while the bones are where they should be. And then slowly, 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 they start to move back. Mine have, my mom's have, Sumer's have, and all of his clients because they do before and after. It's in, unbelievable. It's like a duck. So is, is the philosophy, it's head to toe bone alignment, but it starts with the feet and even more specifically the big toe. The big toe. This is like insane learning that, yeah. that, that I, that I got. <laughs> so all of my workouts now, and dude, when I was doing jujitsu in Ulis, I did three months straight, went every day, you know, it, it just loved it. And I got injured. Of course. Multiple injuries. And I was like, Fuck. so I told Sumer, he's like, do my course follow it don't resist the temptation from doing like your macho work you know your alpha work right, like, right. don't just trust the process align your whole body then you can do jujitsu till you're 100. what jiu kind of injuries did you have at that point? lower back okay um uh, one my left my left side uh lateral side of my big toe um, got, got hurt. Like, so basically what happened is I was grappling with like a 300 pound guy and, uh, or like 320 or 340. It was a big dude, right? Tall, big dude. So I was gra grappling with him and I got in a position where I was trying to flip him. But as I flipped him, he landed on my big toe, <laughs> like right on it. And, 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 and I know that this happened because I, I wasn't able to move fast enough or something happened where like it was like asleep right like all of the blood had been pushed out of the toe in one moment yeah man so that hurt uh and that was like a month i needed to recover i mean i i went back i still kept doing the jujitsu even with the injury but 
and, and then my lower back. Um, so my left side, lower back hurts whenever I do intense workouts. So for example, jujitsu, uh, heavy lifts, if I do hours of dancing, right? Anything that is very, uh, it, it's like burdensome, yeah. like a load. Sure. Your it, left lower side. It hurts, man. And what is that attributed to? God knows. Okay. But, but, the but, Lord knows. But, but my guess is hip flexors, something to do with not using other parts of the body while I'm doing these exercises. Like a simple example, whenever I do dumbbell squats, for instance, back in the day when I would do dumbbell squats, I wouldn't feel all the muscles in my leg. I would feel a little bit here and there. But after doing this bone alignment work for you know, a year, like hardcore for a year, I am feeling all my muscles in my leg when I do my part, my uh, kettlebell. Like they're getting worked. Yeah, you can. Like I can feel my quad, my hams, my glutes, like in a motion. Like, is that and you're I, using all those muscles where you didn't used to be? I never used to feel them. I never used to. I see. So yeah, you're out of alignment, basically, not balanced. That's it. I never, I never used what I would have used, like being a baby. That's what happened. Yeah, man. Tell me, like, tell me about your, your MMA. Because uh, one thing that I've learned is if we do things we like, we continue to do them. Sure. And we tend to like things that we get good at. <laughs> so if, if, uh, if you want to find your passion and you're not sure where to look, just try to get good at something. And the better you get at it, the more passionate about it you'll be. Certainly MMA for me, um, I grew up uh, playing a lot of competitive team sports, hanging out with a lot of dudes, definitely very kind of masculine centric, I suppose. Um, and we were always fighting, like just constantly getting in fights. Uh, so I got very comfortable with violence and, um, you know, starting and ending fights. Now, of course, these are not like fighting for your life type of fights. It's not like a street fight where someone's trying to stab you. These are more like men flexing, wanting to like show the other one who's boss and like maybe, maybe send them to the hospital, but they don't truly want to hurt each other. Um, so just very comfortable with that. I have studied everything, uh, jujitsu, Muay Thai, grappling, wrestling, all of it. Um, but never studied anything for like a long period, you know, never studied one thing and got like really, really deep into it. So now that I've been training again and actually studying jujitsu and boxing, I, uh, of course, am finding out how, how much I don't know <laughs> how, and just how complex it is. Um, and while I've always been very comfortable, um, kind of going toe to toe, uh, and that's just sort of happened gradually over time. Um, just finding out the actual, um, the form and, and the skill and, you know, it's like a, it's a chess match and really like using my body properly, being defensive. Uh, there's just so much to keep track of. Like right now I'm just focused, just focused on boxing and Muay Thai. Okay. And it's like, I'm just at the point where I can put together combos while having my footwork make sense and move around my opponent while also paying attention to them and potentially covering myself and slipping. And that, that's, those are like three completely separate parts of your brain that are working in unison. <laughs> wow. Um, so I'm loving it. It's a fantastic workout, of course, but I'm just loving learning. Like I'm, you know, improving, getting better. And of all the skills that a man should have in his lifetime, uh, being able to defend himself and his family would be one. I love that, man. And, uh, I want to I want to keep you in Tulum, so I'm going to tell you something <laughs> about Muay Thai. So uh, I have buddies that are doing Muay Thai here. It's it's literally downstairs where we, where we are right now. Just go downstairs, maybe a 20 second walk, literally 20 seconds, and you're at the best they claim, the best Muay Thai gym in this part of the world. Okay. Number one. And the story that the, some of the pros told me. One of the guys I podcasted recently, he, he told me that um, during COVID, Thailand required shit. 
for from people like you know vaccines and tests and visa weird stuff document this document that and um mexico didn't so all the guys who were gonna go to thailand to continue their career mm -hmm. they came here okay and they've been here and they're still here because they got used to the life of tulum right so this gym dude they're swearing by it they swear they said it's the best people they're so encouraging one of my buddies mo from montreal we met like uh, 10 years ago uh, we were roommates in montreal and now he's in tulum i i saw him like uh, a few months ago he's like, mm -hmm. what the fuck is he, <laughs> what, awesome. mo is he your shit? like he was last night at uh, we did brazilian zook dancing he was there too he's a dancer and also a muay thai guy so he told me that the camaraderie mm. the friendship the the the, the, the brotherhood mm -hmm. at this gym is like nothing else, man. Highly, it's awesome. I highly recommend anything I can do to keep you in Tulum. <laughs> <laughs> well, brotherhoods are good. I'm definitely big on them. Um, and yeah, those Thai fighters will fuck you up, man. I spent uh, two weeks in a, a Thai, like live-in Thai boxing gym in, in Thailand, uh, Koh Samui. And like these little dudes, like they can cut you in half with their kicks it's crazy <laughs> but um brotherhoods are good um kind of bridging off of what i was saying about growing up always being around other athletes and you know that bond that gets created when you kind of sweat and bleed together and travel together and fight together or sometimes fight each other <laughs> um that's strong and something i've been missing uh, as long as you and I have known each other and prior to that, as long as I've been a digital nomad really is, uh, you know, kind of that community, uh, kind of those friendships. Um, I've always had like a best friend, like at least one or two dudes that are like, we're just ride or die. So I haven't had that for a while. And maybe about two, three months ago, uh, in Playa, I joined a men's group. Uh, I was invited to a men's group and it was like eight or nine dudes and you kind of sit in a circle and kind of like the, the trainer thing I never thought about being part of a men's group I'm like what are we, what are we gonna do hold hands and cry like what is this um but I was like cool and of course it's uh it's guys talking about uh, what's on their mind and it's great to hear that everyone's kind of dealing with the same issues everyone's sort of uh concerned about their career and trying to find a, a maybe pivot their career into something they're more passionate about things of that nature. But, um, anyway, it's, it's just created this wonderful brotherhood. Um, you know, some, there's almost like little sub groups within the group. Like some of us bond a little bit more than others and we hang out. Um, so I'm happy to say I finally have like a crew of bros, um, that uh, I'm pretty tight with for the first time in years. Man. Yeah. Why is it so hard for, for not just digital nomads, but just here in the West, I mean, do you find that it's hard to have that men's circle brotherhood like we have in Tulum and Playa? And Yeah, I think it depends on the person. I mean, if I recall at Digital Jungle, watching you like just work the room was pretty inspiring. You're like the mayor, um, you know, taking time to say hi to everyone and having conversations. Uh, my personality, even though I'm very outgoing, uh, I'm not the most outgoing person in public, I suppose. And especially during the work hours, I usually just have so many things swimming. Uh, so I'd be over there in the corner, you know, went there for a year and a half, made some good friends. But um, for me, I think just, uh, yeah, I've always had that, that activity that connects me with other guys, usually some competitive team sport of some sort, uh, some, something that we're doing together where that's really physical. And that's, that's just like the foundation of most of my bonds with all of my friends my whole life, uh, where I've usually met really good guy friends is playing basketball, just going to the, the pickup court, you know, just you play enough, you just like start enjoying hanging out around each other. Um, so for myself, I think what the, w the reason I found it a little bit challenging is just, uh, haven't been as active, haven't been playing as much basketball or doing as many active things. And just my personality isn't like Mr ultra outgoing. I see. Bal, this, this concept of men's circle is very interesting to me because I remember when I was in Vancouver, 
I was watching a podcast and uh, the guy was talking about initiations. And he said that in certain societies, disparate societies, right? Like the Swede, Swedes or the Native Americans, right? They have very similar initiations for men to go to the next stage of their evolution as men, right? So for example, I know that in Native American culture, they uh, give ice baths to the to babies. Like, you know, they put the baby inside the water, you know, the full thing. Not like a Baptist thing, but like, you know, uh, regular, like every day. Like train them. And I know that in Swedish culture, there's an event where the, the son has to go uh, by himself or with like some, some people into the forest and live on just fast like there's no food nothing you just if you if you kill something you can eat it but like goes there with his you know men in his family like uncles and dads and stuff mm -hmm. and the moms i remember the guy was talking about he's like you can see the moms are crying while because he could die he'll be in danger right and as the son and is like departing through that bridge the the mom is crying but the moms know that this is good for the kid like they're not uh, uh they're they're not soft they're like hardcore people and so there are these initiations that happen i know in uh, in in there's a tribe in 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 some jungle in africa um i don't remember i used to remember exactly the name of the tribe but their initiation is when uh, a, a man becomes an adult his task is to go up uh, this 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 tree thing all the way up, and they've built a rope system mm -hmm. where you tie your feet to the rope. Yeah, and it's like bungee jumping minus the bungee part. Right, and what happens is you jump inches away from the ground, and then everyone's like ah, you know, like all, all the women are like yeah, he, he's a man, he's a man, like you know, he he could like Crazy. now procreate, <laughs> right? Like okay, it's it's done, it's done. like mar marriage time. And so there's all these, like the bar mitzvah is, sure. is one, right? There's all these things. In, if a person is not a part of any of these cultures, or even is a part but just doesn't take part mm -hmm. in these traditions, do you see that there is something missing where we have not earned our masculine way, our freedom? Is there something missing? Absolutely. I would say um, it's, uh, this is like all throughout the ages, I would say every tribe has some form of initiation where young adult goes through some, some trial, some test, something that's intended to, to test them as a human so that they, they understand what it's like to suffer and they understand what it's like to overcome obstacles. And I would say in the Western world or just built up worlds, that's absolutely missing. It becomes more just up to the dad to kind of um, do that with their son. But if the dad is absent or just doesn't think that way, then they miss out on that. And I would actually go so far as to say that the generation coming behind us is potentially a softer generation of men um, because they're being buffered more from potential not only are they not having those initiations but their their parents and guardians are ensuring that they never really have to go through anything brutal or anything really hard whereas i would go so far as to say that not only should men have something like that leaving home try, trying to figure things out on their own but depending on how you want to raise your daughters um at least the way i would raise mine is have her go on something like that as well. I want her to have those life skills and, and experience those challenges that we don't normally associate with something that we want with women. We want them to be soft and, you know, just pure and so on. But um, certainly men, uh, but I would say all people, is like you, you can't build character without a little bit of suffering, without being scared, without having to figure things out on your own. And... The more suffering you have, the more character you build, as long as that suffering isn't so brutal that it creates, you know, mental health issues, things of that nature. But, uh, but overcoming it is just, just as satisfying 
as anything. And I think that's where the, the competitive team sports and that bond that I was talking about that, that happens between men that play together is because it's hard, you know, like you're practicing every day. I'm, I'm going back to like college. I'm thinking when I played basketball in college, like, you know, you're bleeding, you're sweating, like you're not happy and you're, you're losing, you know, you're, you're suffering, you're taking that pain as a team of losing. You're also getting the highs of winning. You're getting, you know, wonderful moments that you get to share. So it's this mixed bag of like fantastic moments, but just as many, if not more, very, very challenging, difficult moments. And you're experiencing that together. So it, it bonds them. And I would even say it's maybe the modern version of that kind of ritual of, uh, of becoming a, a young adult to a man. Besides team sports, are there other obstacles that you have put yourself into? Because team sports, yeah, there's suffering, but there's fun. I mean, sure. It's, it's awesome to play basketball. It's awesome to grapple, right? It's, it's a safe environment. You're not at war, really. Right. Right? So have you put yourself in any situation on purpose with the sole reason to make yourself tougher? Yes. And I would say it happened much later in life for me. Um, when I graduated school in Canada, I moved to the United States, really kind of was focused on my career, really kind of actually obsessed with it, I would say. Um, around when I was 40, so this is like seven years ago, I reached a bit of a peak to my career, meaning uh, I really wanted, I worked in branding, advertising, and my goal was to become a creative director. Uh, I wanted to be a creative director at like one of the seven award-winning advertising agencies in the United States. That was like my big goal. There's one in New York, the, the one that seven. did Nike. Um, Nike would be... Oh, I used to remember this. My, my, my friend always talked about them. Yeah. Because uh, he worked at Nike for four years and he's like, this company got credit for all of Nike's branding. They have a really cool name too. Anyway, yeah. it'll come. I'm not as much on that scene, but I know the the agency that you're talking about. There's there's like six or seven big ones. Um, but you wanted to be the head honcho. I wanted to be a creative director. A creative director is uh, in charge of the creative, um, so they have several teams and they kind of command them. They're, they would be like the LeBron James, like they're on the court, uh, but they're dishing assists, grabbing rebounds, and if needed, they'll hit the open shot. Um, pretty much, you know, great job. Um, anyway, long story short, I. I get to that goal, I uh, actually surpass it, I end up being the director of all digital creative at TBWA, which is one of these advertising agencies. They're owned by Omnicom that owns like half of those agencies, which I didn't even know. Um, and then I went through a period of kind of like, what's next for me? Um, I was so obsessed with that career and achieving that goal and like little humble brag here, but I got so good at it that I could actually show up and put in 50% and no one would even know. I could just kind of like phone it in. Um, and I became sort of deeply unsettled, you know, when your entire identity revolves around this thing that you do and you no longer enjoy it as much. Um, so the but way- what, what happened? Why didn't you enjoy it? Was um, it because you got to the peak? It, it became boring. It became um, very, it's almost like, um, you, you create templates in your mind, uh, formulas of how to do things, um, you know, like uh, branding campaigns, marketing campaigns, websites, advertising, uh, YouTube spots, all of these things. And, you know, it's kind of like when you think about movies, right? You know how they say there's only like seven actual plots, right? It's all just you just swap out the characters and the challenges and basically their variation. So yeah, I'd been doing it for like 17 years and I just had it so locked in that it wasn't like challenging anymore. It wasn't like I was, it wasn't like when I was younger, when I was learning something new every day, every week and, you know, just kind of wor and working my way up the chain. I had like a, you know, a goal to get to. So I was constantly getting rewarded with some sort of validation. So that, that was kind of gone for me and the getting back to your question of putting myself in a difficult position. Um, so I had like a, a pretty cushy situation on the inside. I'm no longer feeling challenged. I'm actually like going through 
at the time I didn't know it, but looking back at it, it was a very, very rough time. Like I was, I, I wasn't working out. I like was eating whatever I wanted. Where were you living at that time? Los Angeles. Okay. Like. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I started having a glass of wine with dinner and then I would have two and then whatever. Um, not exactly being my best self. And it all started with this kind of like dissatisfaction. Um, so I had to fix that. And the reason why it was hard is because it was actually like a very comfy situation. Um, you know, I'm being flown around to pitch and present in front of these big global clients. Um, I've got like a 600 person creative department. Uh, I don't really have a boss. He's the chief creative officer. We just meet once a week. I basically got carte blanche. I'm like a little bit of a, like a man about town at this agency. Like all the cute girls have little crushes on me and just like, you know, not, not horrible. Um, but for me, deeply unsatisfying. <laughs> so I decided to, um, become a digital nomad. That was actually, my goal was like, uh, I was also a workaholic. I guess I should mention, like I barely went on vacation, hardly ever traveled. Uh, so I just decided that, okay, I need to see the world a little bit. I need to change um, my career essentially. Cause at that time, and I think still like a creative director is not something you do remote. You just can't, so it's too, it's way too hands-on. It's so team oriented. Uh, so I shifted into a, a more specific focus, which was design software design, which is what I do now. Um, because you could do that remotely. And I, I guess this wouldn't be like the craziest thing, but, um, you've heard of the term, the golden handcuffs. Golden handcuffs means, uh, you have a job where you make a lot of money, but you're not really happy. So you buy things like houses, cars, toys, um, which means, you don't really save your money. So you got to keep working and you're in this like little cycle. So I had the golden handcuffs in that I actually hadn't saved that much money. I wasn't good with my finances. So I think I had like 20 grand in the bank, if I recall, which wasn't very much for me considering how quickly I spent money back then. Um, but I did, uh, I did have a friend that had a project and it was a design project and I was like, okay, I'll take it. I got a three month runway. I got 20 grand in the bank, quit my job and uh immediately started making foolish decisions like uh i went to hong kong because i was like i can live anywhere now i'll go to hong kong um and experience that um which was awesome i don't regret it but i learned very quickly that uh time zones or uh, change things kind of there's a few late nights there that <laughs> didn't make it ideal um but yeah that that kicked off like five years of you know, being for the first time in a long time, kind of being scared, like not knowing what's around the corner, like actually having to find my clients as opposed to working at an agency where there's just endless amounts of work. There is no promotion. There is no, um, you know, additional bonus or anything. You basically need to f find what you eat and you never know what's going to happen. And there was a couple... There was one time in particular, I remember it was Christmas. This is like not that long ago. This is like 2017 or something. And I was down, I can't remember why, but I was down to like five grand in the bank. So I, I made money and then I spent it. Same kind of thing. Like all in all, it worked out well. Uh, but it was December. And in that industry, no one's hiring in December. Like the industry's asleep. And I was, I think it got down, it got down really low, like down to like two grand or something. And I was in Richmond, Vancouver at the time at a car and I was getting ready to like, what if I run out of money? Like what, what if this happens? What am I going to do? Um, so I was like, okay, if it happens, I will sleep in my car. Like I had an Airbnb at the time, but it was going to run out. Right. And I like, didn't have enough money to like get another month and I had no prospects. And I was like, okay, this is still, this is after you, you quit. Correct. And how much after? The, uh, it was two, like two and a half years. Yeah. So some, some, some nice wins, some uh -huh. big projects. Uh -huh. uh, and, and like this, this in particular was like, I, I had a, a nice camera and I was into photography and videography at the time. And I was like, you know what, if, if I can't rustle, if I get really like run out of money, I'll go 
door to door to retail spots. Um, I'll offer to take photos, make videos for them for their social media. And if they like it, then they can have me come back and pay me. Um, so like I, it was basically like almost homeless, right? Homeless, but you know, I've got a computer, I've got gear, I've got skills, but like that was pretty damn close <laughs> considering like the previous 17 years of my life and career, I just always had a paycheck, just, you know, unlimited kind of what felt like just funds always coming in. Um, so I, I would say, even though that I was like 40, 43, like pretty, like definitely an adult, but like that was like definitely a trialing period where I felt like I just went from not boy to man, but like a man to a real man. Like I was just like, okay, like this is my life. I, I've been in this dream world all this time thinking I just like have unlimited funds and they're always going to be coming in. But like now I actually have to earn it and like think ahead and save, be smart and so on and so forth. Um, it, I ended up getting another project even before the end of the year. Uh, it was Nokia, designed Nokia's website. So it was, it was a big project was a good one. Uh, everything worked out after that, but like, I'll never forget that feeling of being like that close to being out of money basically. Um, and not having any resources or like, you know, I could always phone my family or something, but that wasn't really, I didn't even feel like that was an option. I was like, I'll, I'll live out of my car. I'll figure it out. But yeah, that was, that was, uh, that was good. I feel like I grew a lot, you know, like a lot of, a lot of good character was created at that time. And now I'm kind of fearless a little bit, you know, just cause you go through something like that, come out the other end and you're like, okay, I can handle it. Something you can feel and can deny cause you had first, first hand experience. Yeah. 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 One thing you said about, uh, poverty and, um, being at the brink of being homeless reminds me of one of the letters of Seneca. Okay. Um, so there's this book, Letters, Letters from a Stoic, and uh, I read it years ago. And, you know, it's Seneca I keep coming back to and learning from him, and I'm rereading it now. So today, uh, so my sort of routine is I read Stoicism when I'm shitting, basically. That's my, that's my thing. So uh, it's like very, very uh, calm, very peaceful, and, and I'm just... How long are your shits? Very, very short. <laughs> okay. Very short. So I, a few I, passages... Oh my God, like two, two pages, Okay, two pages out of the, it's I mean, a, you must read fast. Actually, that's kind of impressive. But I mean, these are, the font is not, it's not like a Dostoevsky or a Tolstoy. Okay. It's like, a, it's <laughs> like, you know, a, a, a ki kitty book, but, but very deep. Right. So in the current Seneca, he's talking about poverty and his notion. So, so it's a chapter about festivals. And what Seneca did was whenever there was a festival in Rome, he would do the opposite of what everyone was doing, right? So everyone was like drinking, staying up late, feasting, right? Doing deviant stuff. And he would go on a 10-day fast during that time. And one of the stoic uh, sort of philosophies or, or guidances is you should know how it feels to be poor. Either life will bring that to you or do it to yourself. Understand and fully embrace the feeling of poverty because you are never far from it. Anything can happen in life. And we know people have, have you know, these, and you've felt it firsthand, you know how it is. And so it, it, what, when you were talking about it, it reminded me of something I literally read today in, in, in one of the letters. And he just said that, look, if you can, and, and again, this is like an initiation, right? This is like something you can initiate. So one thing that I've done throughout my life, at least in the last 10 years, is extended fasting, right? So I started around 2015 when I would do every single weekend a 48-hour fast. I did it for like six months, every weekend, 48-hour fast, every weekend. And uh, so I would basically eat five days of the week. And two days would be a fast. And I remember on the third morning, the day, the day I'm supposed to break the fast, 
right? So like the Monday, so it would be Saturday, Sunday, no eating. And then Monday morning, I would break the fast. And I remember still, I would wake up. I used to live at a gym. So uh, I would wake up and, you know, they would, the hip hop music would be going on. Sure. People are training. It's like 5 a.m. I would wake up and I would feel so serene, so calm, right? There's like no food. Like there's no glycogen. Like it's like there's nothing. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't even hungry. Right? It was just like, because the first two days are hard, but then it's like, whatever. Right. And I still remember I would uh, go in the in the turf, talk to some of the clients of the gym, right? And I would sometimes do my, my squat, you know, the squat we were talking about, you squat like, uh, uh, and then you said you, like, you can do 15 minutes, for example, right? So I would just squat and practice how long can I squat? Just talking to people squatting. And... Uh, even though, and, and being on a fast when you squat, it's like extra soreness, okay. <laughs> like really bad. And I, I still remember I would be doing that and my head was so clear. It was like everything had slowed down. And, and I know that, you know, thank God that I haven't felt in, in, in real life what poverty is, thank God, right? I, I haven't come close to it. I've always had like, you know, always been okay, thank God, right? But in those moments of fasting, for me, that I did to myself, it wasn't like someone told me like, you can't eat food or, you know, you're in solitary confinement. Right. I did it to myself. And all of those moments were so blissful because I got the understanding of what's important in life and what's not important in life. Because... When you're really hungry, like I've done a few five-day fasts. So on the fifth day, you become like, like my head, my brain doesn't even work. Like I remember one time in, uh, in New York, I was taking a, I was filming a video near the, the uh, Brooklyn Bridge. And I was, I was on the, on the, the, you know, where the water is. The bridge was right behind me. I was at a bench, had the camera in front of me. I had my gear, you know, my, my suit and all that recording a video. And man, my brain didn't work. I, like my, it was like jumbled up words. Mm. I was that hungry. <laughs> and I was like, damn, I got to eat or I won't be able to function. And now I, at that moment, I can imagine that, okay, people without food, they feel like this all the time, right? So you say, you tell people like, oh, you, you just work, go work. Why are you poor? <laughs> like, well, why are you, well, you, oh, you, you're hungry. Well, you should be working. But if your brain doesn't even work and you become that helpless, because dude, I, I mean, when I, when that happened, I went to the store, I got some food, I ate. Sure. Yeah. Was, you're like problem solved. Easy. Yeah. And I was good. I recorded my video, went home. But yeah, man, it, it's, it's something about putting ourselves in trouble on purpose. Right, like the ice bath, or the travel. Like one time, I went to Colombia with only a cell phone. Okay, that's it. Because I, I was in Bed Stuy at the time mm -hmm. in uh, in Brooklyn, very depressed, like kind of fed up of life, helpless, uh, a feeling you know like learn helplessness. It was like a few months of of being down, and my buddy in in Australia, my best friend Luke, uh, I called him, I FaceTimed him, and I told him, hey. Uh, Look, man, this is how I feel. And he's like, Farhan, you got to go to Colombia. Go to Medellin, Colombia. And I'm like, what? What? Why? He's like, uh, just trust me. Just go there. Book your ticket right now. Go ahead. And he made me book my ticket on FaceTime that moment for the next day. Okay. And I did it because I, I, he's like my trust spiritual yep. you know, father. Like I, I trust him, whatever he says. He's like empath and he can like look at you. And he can like feel your childhood trauma. I remember one time we were in Florida, we were at a bar and we met a few girls. And uh, one of the girls, he's like, I can feel what her dad did to her. I can feel it, bro. Right? And, and he, he knew what her star sign was like that, like Aquarius or, you know, one of those uh, astrologies, like, oh, you're Pisces. And she was like, yeah, I am. And then, and then he took her and he talked to her about what happened just like a stranger right and then the girl comes back and and she you know i was with the other friends and she's like uh 
this is scary because Luke just told me somehow he knows what happened in my past. We got to get out of here. <laughs> she was freaked out. She was freaked out. Yeah. And Luke was like, well, that's what I do. <laughs> so can't turn it off. Yeah. So he told me to go to Colombia and I did. I took my cell phone, was there a couple of months, just bought clothes there because mm -hmm. I wanted to just leave with, with nothing, just my phone. I was going to leave without my phone, but that would have been crazy. <laughs> you could imagine, right? Like boarding pass. Yeah. Um, damn, I don't know. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so so that um, that type of but that was putting, a challenge for you. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's why. That's why I went for it. And yeah, man, it's like a you get. I've never put myself in a challenge that I regret, like mm. ever, yeah. ever. One of the things um, most people don't know is that the night before I came to Tulum, I shaved my head. And I made a video out of it. Like I had the, all, the, all this full head of hair, right? Like it's going crazy. People would like message me like, oh, I love how your hair looks, whatever, you know. On like It was your thing. Yeah. And then I, I realized that, well, first of all, my dad is bald, right? So I was like, I'm probably going to be bald one day. I, I accept it. I had some receding hairline, right? This is uh, two, two and a half years ago, whatever. No, two years ago, two years ago, about two years ago. But the receding hairline was there like five years ago, right? I knew it was going to happen. And uh, so I was like, okay, there is this insecurity in me when it comes to my hair, right? I would, I would make sure to put enough product in my hair so it wouldn't like get messed up to, to, from wind, mm -hmm. right? I would make sure like I wear a hat, if there was any risk of, of, of someone seeing my receding hairline, I was very insecure, like extremely insecure for like four years. And then August 1st, 2021, because I came to Tulum August 2nd. August 1st, I made a video. I showed my hair. I said, guys, I'm going to shave. I'm going to shave my head right now. And I shaved the thing. I took a whole video on it and uh, I've shaved my head since. And, and you don't think about it nearly as much as you used to. <laughs> at, at all, dude. Right. It's like, I don't even remember that Farhan. Mm. I'm just used to this Farhan now. Mm -hmm. Right? And the relief that you get when you let go of that which is here and constantly taking your energy. When you let go, it's the biggest, like, burden off. And the first few months were hard, obviously. <laughs> were like, they? You know, I, I went to Ulysses and I saw all my family. They're like, what the fuck, right? Um, but my really true friends, man, they accepted it from day one, right? And it was great because I was coming to a new city where I didn't know anyone. So no one here knew the old Farhan, right? Makes things a lot easier. Like, so, man. So, I, yeah, I, I just remember, like, the moments when we, on purpose, do hard stuff, mm -hmm. and it's always for the good. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, that challenging time that I told you about, uh, I don't know that I've had a time that challenging since, but ever since then... And, and kind of before then, when I chose to leave my job, I've been putting myself through micro challenges, um, just like staying uncomfortable, not wanting to get too, too comfortable. Like I mentioned when I was in Hong Kong, I stayed in one of these capsule hotels. It's like this little high tech coffin, basically, <laughs> that you, you know, put all your stuff in, in a locker and you sleep there at night. It was in the middle of Kowloon, which is like well into the city. It's one of these places where it's just like a sea of people. Um, I'm not speaking any Mandarin, um, you know. Um, but yeah, the travel has really helped with that. Uh, just And being a kind of minimalist, um, you know, talking about letting go of your hair, just letting go of gadgets or toys or shoes or anything, um, you know, that you're interested in. I'm usually, I'm a big gadget guy. So getting rid of my drone... Uh, getting rid of my my big DSLR camera, which I just loved, but don't really need it now anymore because the iPhone does everything. Um, you know, th those are uh, challenging, sort of. 
but there, I guess there are minor challenges when you think about it. But then when I think about myself in my kind of past life where I was fully just living, not like LA lifestyle, but definitely like a contemporary modern dude lifestyle, like definitely, you know, dating a lot and trying to feel like a, like a big, big man or something. Um, yeah, I like to just keep myself, um, re really minimal, really detached from things. Um, I also, uh, cut my hair recently. If you recall when we met, I had, it was longer and I wore yeah. it in a little top bun. I remember. And I just noticed that, uh, I would have to retie the top bun every time I put on my motorcycle helmet and took it off. And I just was constantly retying it. And I'm like, this is taking time and energy away from, from me here. Why don't I just get rid of this? But yeah, I hear you. Congrats, man. Yeah. Congrats for, uh. It wasn't as big a deal for me though. I was just like, cool, done, later. <laughs> it wasn't like a ritual. Uh, well, a little bit. I've turned it into one. You know, I actually like shaved it with a, with a razor. Ah. Partially because I was like, I hear if you shave it, it'll grow back thicker. Okay. <laughs> I don't think that works. Yeah, probably not. It's one of, the, it's one of those things you hear. And right. People, people market it and make it a fad. Um, Bell. Speaking of travel, um, I was thinking of this last night when I was preparing for the podcast, and I remember you went on that trip in your, in your motorcycle. Yeah. And um, very few people would get a chance to do something like that. The childhood um, dream. Right. So let's, why is that, why was that so important to you? What happened, um, if you can take us back to Little Bell? And uh, that moment when you had this dream, or those those times of dreaming like that, what what was that bell situation? <laughs> well, it's all about discovery and adventure, right? <clears throat> so what you're referring to is riding across Mexico on a motorcycle for around six months, um, which I say childhood dream, just just dream, adventurous dream, like something I always wanted to do. Um, and yeah, I think I've always had that kind of discovery, um, leaving Canada as a young man and moving to the United States, you know, by myself, um, leaving my job so that I could travel, things like that. And it was, it was uncomfortable. You know, it was the, the unknown. It's uh, exactly what you were probably feeling when you went to Medellin with just your passport and a phone. Um, I don't know. Like, I, I know where I'm going, but I'm only booking my stays so many days in advance. I've reduced everything in my life to what I can fit on the back of a motorcycle um, and just riding. And there were challenges. In fact, I was intending to go down all the way down to Panama through Guatemala. And when I got to the border of Guatemala, they wouldn't accept my motorcycle. I think I was just supposed to bribe them, but I didn't, like, my Spanish wasn't good enough. I didn't understand. I didn't get it. Uh, so they wouldn't let my bike over. They let me over. Um, so I stayed in Mexico and ended up going through the mountains of Chiapas and into Oaxaca and, and going way up into the mountains of Oaxaca and doing mushrooms, like having a crazy mushroom journey, um, kind of unintentionally. Uh, I think I did the classic thing where, um, you know, you have some mushrooms and you, I don't know if you've ever done them, but they're, you know, they're dry. They don't look like much, right? And you just take a little bit and you're like, well, that was a much. I'll just take more. And then I just ended up having a really interesting trip uh, that was also very challenging. But um, so many challenges in that trip, um, but wonderful. Um, something that I noticed that was a huge takeaway. Um, so I started the trip in December. I had a month off of work, um, meaning I had no project and I had a project lined up in the new year. And uh, I noticed around two weeks in that I was always in a hurry to get to the next place. Uh, like I was always looking at my watch and suddenly I was like, I have no commitment, no deadlines, no meetings. Why am I in a hurry? Like, well, what is going on here? Why am I so concerned about the time? Cause I would just get to the next destination and then what, go into my hotel. Like yeah, I had nothing like to do. And it was a huge insight. And then it made me realize that I, in my work life, I'm just constantly aware of time. Always got some meeting, some deadline, something that's coming up. And I had, that was just like built in. It was so built in that 
that I was still doing it, even though I didn't have any commitments of any sort. So it took me two weeks just to even notice that. And then I spent the next two weeks trying to unwind. Uh, like I took off my watch. I started looking at my day in terms of energy instead of time. Like instead of thinking like, oh, I have, you know, seven hours to complete this. I would think of like my body and my mind as like a battery and be like, how full is it? Um, what do I want to accomplish with this energy that I have? Um, so that was amazing. And then the trip extended for another five months while I was working. I uh, just spent like one month in a place and then rode in between. My girlfriend, Catherine, would fly in between and meet me at the next destination. It was great. Loved it. So, so back to the childhood dream. It's just about exploration. Like, because as a child, I mean, I, I don't know, a lot of, I, I don't think a normal child would like dream of riding a motorcycle, <laughs> you know? He might go to, okay, outer space or go into different planets or something, but like, why, why motorcycle? Well, because they're dangerous. Um, uh -huh. Riding a motorcycle like a real motorcycle down a highway, down a windy, a treacherous That's... Uh, side of a mountain is uh, akin to skydiving. You can fall. Yeah. You, um, you know, you, you are in control. Obviously, you can mitigate chances of an accident, but you never know. There is always a chance that some bus can run over you from nowhere. So you're rolling the dice a little bit. Um, I mean, if you know how to ride, you can make it so it's kind of like skydiving. There's always a chance both chutes won't open, but like if you if you do it properly, it's a very very small percentage. Um, but it's dangerous. It's exhilarating. Um, definitely like adrenaline rush, and um, and then there's that uh, you know as a kid, I don't think I thought of it this way, but certainly it's that self development that comes out of kind of being alone. Um, setting out into the sunset, you know, not being absolutely certain of what you will encounter uh, or how you'll deal with it. All of the, the best personal growth that I've got in the last five, six years has come through travel and, and specifically the unknown. I don't mean like booking, a, you know, a week at a resort <laughs> thing kind of travel. I mean like the travel of like, let's go to this city that I've never been to and I'll figure out my new routines. I'll find my new gym, my new co-working space. So I'll, I'll like rebuild all of my routines and I'm not sure how I'm going to do that or what resources I'll have. But I'll do it. Well, I know you're, you are in the space of living an optimal life from, from how I know you, right? Absolutely. And I know that, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you're, if, if I know you and if you're like me, cause I'm like that too, we try to optimize like every little thing. Yep. Right. So for example, um, a few days ago, my trainer Sumer, he sent me, uh, this device that they just made recently, which, uh, you can like turn a knob and it takes your big toe away from the little toe. It's literally like surgery. So I don't know if you've ever seen a bunion surgery, no. but what they do is they put a like a little coil wire into your skin, right? So it, it pierces it, goes to the other side, and then they're literally turning a knob and they're going with, with it's, it's a circular, they move it like 15 degrees. Okay. And they go like that. And that's how bunion surgery happens. Like you're like, you're, you're literally, uh, um, I don't know exactly what they're doing to the actual bone, but that's how they correct the bunion in a oh, surgery. Remind me what a bunion is. Bunion is, so imagine this is your foot. It's the thing that is... Um, like a callus, really bad callus? Right, okay. right. And some people have it bad. Right. And some people have it so bad that their big toe is like like that. Right. It's like above the, 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 second, the second toe. It's like really bad. And and really bunions, out of bone alignment. And bunions hurt, man. Like I don't, I don't have any, any like severe bunion. I, mine is like very moderate, but I want to make it really good. Uh, but I know some people who have like surgeries or they would feel pain, like constant pain as they're walking. And I've seen it. It's like, 
this like nasty looking thing, man. Like is if I had that, I wouldn't show my feet to anyone. Right. <laughs> like what the hell? <laughs> Uh, and it's it's a big insecurity too, man. It's a big insecurity, and it's sad that we let ourselves do that. But how do you? Because I struggle with this a lot. So so when I saw this bunion cor connect, uh, corrector thing, it's like a UK company. I ordered one for me, one for Martha, one for my mom, one for my dad. Mm -hmm. Fuck, we gotta we gotta get this. We gotta correct our feet, mm -hmm. right? And then uh, why didn't you order one for me? What's going on? Oh, uh, you're tight, bro. Bro, just kidding. Bro, bro, <laughs> your feet are so sexy. I've seen, I've seen your feet. Bro. And I tell you, it's so so funny. Like whenever I meet someone, I I look at their feet right away. Okay, it's so funny, and and your feet are your. They're, I'm good. They're beautiful, man. Sweet. They're beautiful. I've seen your feet, or I would have gotten you. <laughs> and I didn't want you to feel like you you know get in it's your head idea. about your bunion. Yeah. By the way, uh, Al, you know you have a bunion, <laughs> and you're like, no, I don't. Yeah, you do. <laughs> or maybe a little bit. <laughs> And then it just goes downhill from there. But uh, but then um, but then I started thinking, okay, we also wear sandals, especially like my parents are in Texas, we're in Tulum, we're wearing sandals all the time. Mm -hmm. So Sumer recommended getting uh, a sandals that are known as Earth Runners. Yeah, yeah. You know Earth Runners. Couple runner. pairs. Yeah, so you know. Wow, great. I have so one of them, a pair in my bag if you want to see them. I would love it, man. Yeah, because uh, I I I'm gonna order that too for everyone. So, so just, it's like optimizing, mm -hmm. optimizing your life. Mm -hmm. Like why walk on some shitty sandals and fuck up your foot mm -hmm. when you can walk on something that is minimal and healthy. And grounds you to the earth below and, and forces your feet to deal with the ground like it's meant to. Awesome, man. I'm, I'm happy we talked about it because I, I will look at yours and I, I need some tips on what sizes to order because it's kind of weird. The sizes right. are a bit weird for me because I, I wear Vivos uh -huh. and I compared my Vivos to to earth runners and I compared it with everyone. Right. So I, I looked at Martha's Vivo and Martha's earth runner size. Then I looked at my mom and dad, mom, and then my dad, and then me. And it's like, I wear 12 and a half Vivo, but I'm getting size 11 earth runners. Mm. And I'm like, that's weird. Cause they're getting basically the same or 0.5 more or less. I think Vivo is the weird one because you're like what? 5'10", 5 5'11". 5 so no, no, I'm like more than six. Okay. Yeah, because you're so eleven sounds like a proper shoe size, where twelve and a half would make you have like pretty big feet. I've always had twelve huh? my whole life, and the only reason I did twelve and a half for Vivo is because I ordered twelve, and my feet were too wide, so it would hurt as I would walk. It would like hit. It's just the wide from the front; they're just wide. So uh, that's why I had to get twelve and a half, and twelve and a half are perfect for me. Yeah, yeah, I'm all about the ancestral lifestyle these days. I'm like. Uh... Whatever I can do, like I used to be a big gadget guy, um, you know, aura ring, like anything to optimize. Uh, never been huge with tracking in terms of like manually tracking, mm -hmm. but always liking data. And these days I'm just about like, let's just keep it simple. I don't, I'll just go with how I feel. Um, doing a lot of kind of animal flow, animal movement okay. kind of goes back to uh, our conversation around squatting just realizing, you know, spending so much time in the desk need to kind of like move a little bit more naturally, uh, hanging. I've never been big dead hang like pull ups or things like that, but just, okay. just hanging around, you know, like on the bar. Um, these are becoming like pretty big for me. One thing I learned from Peter Atia, ever heard of him? I've heard of him. Yeah. So he, he recommends doing a dead hang and, uh, a 40 year old should be able to dead hang for two minutes. Okay. And, um, I'm close to two minutes, but I'm not there. Mm. I bet it, it's probably like a plank. Like the first minute is like, all right, I got this. And then all of a sudden it just gets really hard. Cause, cause you also slip. Sure. Right. Rings right. are Your hands. Yeah, yeah. Right. So rings are easier. I can do two minutes on rings, but the pull up bar, it just, right. and then I have to like grab it again. Are you Imagine. able to go from one hand, like just hang from one hand to the other to give one hand a rest? Because I feel like I've seen people doing that. Okay. It's like a little hack. <laughs> That's good. Like they'll just hang from one arm and they're shaking out the other arm and Resting. they'll go back and forth. Yeah. I will have to try that. I don't know if I could, if I could hang on with one arm for like more than five seconds. Yeah. Well, I'll try. Yeah. I'll try. It's I'll gold. try. <laughs> Grip strength is also a cool thing because, um, some of the papers I read about strength training 
they they always, especially with old people, they'll always look at their grip strength because grip strength is what allows you to not injure when you fall. Mm. So like, you know, imagine a guy walking around, he's like, you know, 80, something happens, he falls over. Mm -hmm. he, he's got to catch himself. Yeah. yeah, and that's grip strength. It's also good for fighting. Um, there was a study that was done a couple of years ago. It was about what women find attractive in men. Oh. So they showed a group of women photos of men uh, and they would rate how attractive they were. And there were all different types of people, right? Some were models, some were average. And what they found is the the ones that women thought were the most attractive weren't necessarily the ones that you would think. They weren't like the model-y looking ones. Um, they had certain traits that they all had, which made them look like they were good at fighting. Like they would be a good protector. And those traits were a uh, strong, thick neck and strong forearms and hands, believe it or not. Just looking like a, a protector. Love that. Yeah. But this is a very interesting topic because at Jungle Gym, you haven't been there recently, but very recently what they've done is, you know where you wash your hands, right? Right outside the bathroom? They've put uh, five photos of men who are like steroided up, you know, like uh, clearly jacked bodybuilder physique competition. And look, no, um, no, no hate or anything. Nothing wrong with that. Right. That's your thing. So, it's all good. But what's actually interesting about that is Martha told me right away. It's like, you know, Farhan, I don't know if, if you know what girls think, but those guys look like cartoons mm -hmm. to us. Like that shit is not attractive at all. And I don't know what these guys are up to, <laughs> uh, but because she's like, none of my friends would find any of that attractive. It's like, it's, it's like, too extreme. Um, I think the, uh, I mean, there's, um, I've been having this thought a lot lately as I think about my training regimen and kind of like where I focus and going back a little bit to the ancestral vibe is like, I'm less about bodybuilding, meaning I'm more into calisthenics, things of that nature. Um, while bodybuilding, like bodybuilding, just meaning in the gym with the weights, right? Um, it gives you like a good, uh, physique in terms of like appearance, maybe, uh, unless of course you go way too far with it, but, uh, calisthenics feels like just man strength, you know? And of course you'll get the aesthetics, but maybe not quite the same way or quite as eye catching. Um, but it's more like uh, it works those muscles in between the muscles that like hold the, all of them together. I agree, man. I love it. I love calisthenics, especially be because the animal flow that you talked about mm -hmm. is one of my favorite things because it gives me the ability to be creative and do things that I've never done or thought I could do. And it's just, it feels so good. Like I, and, and also I want to get your thoughts on this. I see, I see guys at the gym with their phones, right? Like I was like, they're like checking something on their phone. And I'm like, fuck, that's weird, man. Like you're here working out. You're, you, it's such a blessing to be here, to like be in your body, feel your breath, right? Be with nature, listen to the birds. And it's like this phone is like absorbed, like you're absorbed in this mm -hmm. device. I've seen this. Um. Yeah, my position on this is it depends what they're doing. Um, if they're literally just checking social media or like filling up their time because they don't want to be present, um, you know, that's just a horrible habit in general that they need to look into. Um, however, if they're, um, you know, uh, sending business emails or, um, uploading a video or whatever, they're actually accomplishing something. If they're using their phone as a tool, as an actual tool to accomplish like an intentional activity as opposed to just kind of filling up space in between sets um then then i see a little bit of value in that but uh these days for myself i try to use my workouts uh like in the theme of life hacks um trying to combine meditation with training so not only do i not have my phone around but i'm like breathing through each rep each set and like when i'm in between sets, I'm just being calm and chill and 
identifying my thoughts and feelings as they pour through my head. Um, and that's literally as a way of trying to like combine these two activities into one. Got it. The reason I brought up the optimal life is because I'm trying to balance being optimal, but at the same time being minimal, mm. right? So sometimes what happens is I will learn some exercise and I will have to buy something <laughs> that is external to my body. Sure. Which is okay. So, I mean, I mean, I take a whole bag full of shit to the gym everywhere I go. And it's like a, the hundred things in there that I need, yeah. right? And I don't know what I'm going to need that day. So I take the whole thing. It's like a, literally a luggage. And uh, I'm, I'm more aligned with, I don't align with that. Like deep down inside. Deep down inside, I align with just my body. Mm -hmm. Not even a pull up bar. Mm. Just me. Why? Because it minimizes my thinking. Sure. Because maybe one Your day choice. I won't have a pull-up bar. I could be in a place, there's no pull-up bar. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to hold on to, right? So that's what I feel I am fundamentally, right? Like even if you, you know, I live in Tulum here, and you used to live here, and we can walk around without, without our shirt, right? So it's so fucking weird. I, at at, uh, at the Digital Jungle and Jungle Gym, I'm without my shirt. So, That's what makes them awesome. You can yeah. be shirtless, shoeless. Dope. <laughs> That's it. And so, yeah, and I, I even told Martha the other day, look, I have these, these tank tops and stuff. You can just wear them because I'm not wearing them. Like I haven't worn it in, in weeks. So it's like um, that fundamental minimalistic, let me focus on my work and playing and, and sharing love with the world, right? And, 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 and what does that involve, right? It's reading, watching podcasts, doing podcasts, taking care of Afro D, you know, whatever they need for ads and whatnot, and staying healthy, you know, helping out my family with, with whatever they need and having the social interactions, right? Basic stuff, sleeping early, waking up early, you know, the basic health stuff. But then whenever there is this pull towards Hey man, you're missing something. You should do that. Like a very simple example is the earth connectors, right? Earth runners. I want to live like a, a, I want my feet to be healthy, right? But then I'm like, ah, now I'm like adding something in my everyday routine. Like now I have to like bring something external into my life, right? So how do you balance? How do you what sort of principles do you use to not have this anxiety? <laughs> you and I are more similar than you know. Um, there's two areas in my life where I am constantly looking for the next gadget or the next thing. One is my workstation, my mobile workstation, uh, just having that set up so that I can like take it anywhere and have it be like the most optimal, like easy to like get into deep work possible and then the other is kind of like fitness and exercise and recovery things um i'm very quick to make a purchase uh on on you know earth runners or whatever like very quick if i feel like it will be helpful at all i'm all in and i'll give it a try in my mind the expense is for the experiment because i've found that sometimes i'll purchase something and you know just it may be helpful, but not worth having this external thing. And then I'm just constantly pruning and getting rid of the things that don't, I don't love. I don't need, need them. Like they're not awesome. And then every so often I buy something and it turns out to like have this massive impact on my life. And I can't even imagine living without it. And I feel like those ones to, to find those ones it's worth it to go through. It's a little bit wasteful, but like to do these little experiments of like, okay, let me try this shoe. Let me, uh, let me get an extra iPad. Cause I really want the new iPad mini. Cause I want to replace my notebook or whatever. Um, and then it, it, it doesn't always work out, but when it does, it's fucking gold. And I'm just like, Oh, it's like a part of you. Yeah, exactly. So I, I stay minimal because I'm actually constantly getting rid of things. Um, 
and and just the things that are left are the things that I really really need and really want. Any game changers for you? I wonder if that scraper thing you're talking about is going to be a game changer. Um, one game changer would was kind of the the Theragun. Um, really, not so much the gun, but there's a ball. Um, it's just like a softball. Which you were using downstairs. Um, the the Theragun, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, but like that thing, that plus the ball, the recovery yeah. ball, which is essentially like a just hard softball thing uh, that you roll on. Yeah, like yeah. if you, I'll show you my supernova. I have it. I got it from a uh, Kelly Starrett. Uh, you heard of this guy, no. Kelly Starrett? He has a company called Mobility Wad. He's a CrossFit guy for 20 years. Okay. And uh, he wrote the book How to Be a Supple, How to Become a Supple Leopard. Okay. And uh, he also wrote a book called uh, Desk. Uh, so it was something about how the harms of sitting. Okay. Uh, Desk Bound. Mm. That's his book. Really, really, really. Uh, he's like world famous in mobility. Mm -hmm. That's his like uh, work of work of art. And he's the one who figured out that. So his uh, his daughters were in uh, first grade or kindergarten at the time. Or his like one of his daughters was in first grade, one was in kindergarten, something like that. And what he found was his little daughter and her friends in kindergarten would uh, sprint normally. You know, how, how people sprint, like okay. the toes, right? Yeah. We don't sprint like this. We <laughs> sprint like this. But then the first graders started walking and sprinting like this. Uh -huh. And they're like, I wonder what's going on. And guess what is the biggest change between kindergarten and first grade in the Amer in America? Sitting. Oh, shit. And they were heel stomping. Huh. While they were running, these first graders. So basically, uh, Kelly's uh, and his wife, they they're, they're, you know, work together on th this stuff and they got standing desks mm -hmm. at the elementary school. Okay. Which is like, wow, awesome. Yeah, yeah. In, in just like little, little, little names. Makes a lot of sense, actually, for a lot of reasons. Not just the, those ones, but just like having the kids be able to move and not be stuck in a chair at such a young age. Yeah. So unnatural. Yeah, man. It's, um, yeah, it's when we talk about the minimalist life and we look at the other side of the world, right? The other side of, of, of the human condition, which is desk work, people sitting all day programming, programming or doing office work, wearing the shoes, which, you know, may, you know, the high heels and, or the shoes that make our toes go like that. So what is that? Like, did we just get lucky to realize this? Because I'm always confused. Like the other day I was at OXO getting uh, some stuff for the toilet and I saw this kid in front of me, like maybe 16 year old. He was, he had a uh, uh, construction paint and stuff all over his clothes. So he's a construction guy. And in each hand, a huge bottle of Coca-Cola. Sure. Right. Yeah. Boom. And you, you'll notice, and, and I, I was thinking about, it, I was like, okay. I'm guessing that his co-worker said, hey, kid, go get us a couple of Coca-Colas from OXO. Mm -hmm. And he was the one to get it because the young, youngest guy. Mm -hmm. Now, he's going to drink that Coca-Cola and maybe drink it for the rest of his life and eat other unhealthy food and, and just live a life which is just like his surroundings. And so I wonder... Because I used to drink Coca Cola too, mm -hmm. I used to eat Taco Bell and yeah. unhealthy. I remember uh, Subway was considered healthy. <laughs> I thought it was being healthy by having Subway. Right now, when whatever happens in life, and we sort of take a step back and say, "Okay, what am I putting in my mouth? How am I moving day to day? What time? What time am I going to sleep? What are my thoughts day to day?" Why do I get depressed? Why do I become demotivated, right? The awareness, the inside voice. Mm -hmm. Why is it that it happens in some people and continues to happen throughout life, whereas some people will just stay trapped and not even know? Hmm. 
for myself, it feels like uh, life experience, maturity, and age have something to do with it. Uh, when I think about, you know, the younger Val, um, I didn't stretch as much, uh, you know, like I basically could get away with a lot more. Um, you know, I didn't need to sleep as much. It's just kind of, uh, you know, when you're super healthy like that, you don't know what, what could go wrong or what you're doing to yourself, right? You, you can go out drinking and wake up the next morning just fine. You can, um, you know, work, I used to work like 14 hours a day as a regular. Like it was just, I loved it. I enjoyed it. It was super fun. Uh, so I just think of it as now I do the things that I always should have been doing, but now like I have to, or I'm aware that how helpful they are to me. Um, and that's just, uh, time and being attentive. Uh, so maybe that's the answer is being like, uh, attentive to yourself inward, seeing how things affect you. But a lot of people won't do that ever, right? Just a simple example, you dreaming when you were a kid about exploring in a, in a motorcycle. That type of dream comes from a person who has the tendency to care and look to what is out there. Mm. And there are others who don't have this tendency. So is it possible to realize a tendency like that? Or or do you just have, like, I'll give you a simple example. My mom, okay? Mm -hmm. So my mom, uh, she is 60, right? She just turned 60. No, she's now, uh, she'll be six, she will be 62 uh, this month, or Tuesday. She'll turn 62 on Tuesday. Happy birthday, mom. Yeah. So um, my mom had this realization of learned helplessness because she has been overweight for decades. Like when she, went, when she got married, she was like uh, 98 pounds, like super skinny, like, and tall too. I mean, tall for like a girl um, and, and, or, or taller than average, let's say, but super skinny. And then at a certain point, she became 210 pounds, wow. right? Same height. Thought you was in me. Right. And me. And so. Um, what happened is last, um, uh, it was around fe end of February, beginning of March ish. I went to Montreal to visit my brother and my mom also came with my dad. So, so I went from here, mom and dad came from Texas. We all met in Montreal for a family retreat. Cause you know, my, 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 uh, brother is there, my sister-in-law, my brother's kids, we, we all met. And I saw my mom coming down the stairs, you know, it's like two floor house and she had to hold the, the bar to come down. And I was like, whoa, like I got a hit, man, like a shock. Cause I was like, wait, my own mother, she's like barely 60 needs a bar to come down the, the stairs. How, where did I fail as a child? I took it upon myself. I put the whole burden on myself. I didn't think of my mom at all. I was like, wait, did I fail as, as a, like, do I not love my mom? Yeah. It's that Indian food, bro. It's not even the barbecue. It's all the, the Indian curry stuff and the, the vegetable fully. Not my brother, not my dad. I felt responsible and, and more so because I'm in this field. Like I've been obsessed about health for 10 years, obsessed. So when I saw my mom like that, I was like, wait, I'm helping all of these people, all of our customers get in shape and transform their bodies, blah, blah, blah. And my mom own mom, like I haven't even cleaned my own room and I'm criticizing other people's houses, right? So a year ago, I uh, took a, an oath essentially. And I, I told my mom that I will transform you. I take the responsibility 100%. So that was the time when we were in Tulum. And th that's when, when I had gone to Montreal, I called Marta. I said, listen, we're going to live at a hotel near my parents. We're going to both go. If you're okay with it, you know, it's your decision, but I would love it if you came and we would give her three months. 
full time, three months, train her every day, monitor her food, exactly what she eats, I determine it, take her to Sumer in Austin every two weeks to so he can train her because, you know, I trust, this is one guy I trust as a trainer. And so we came here, packed our bags and went to Ulyss and was there, th were there three months, right? And between then and now, my mom lost 40 pounds, 40 pounds, 210 to 170. Now she's 170. And uh, the learned helplessness that she had then, these are the things she would say. Farhan, uh, it's hard. It's impossible to lose weight. I can't, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be able to lose weight. The doctor says I need knee surgery. I got to get knee surgery. She'd already booked the appointment. She'd already figured out how much it was going to cost. So, you know, get, getting the money in order, right? My dad was prepared, right? She had told me. And dude, her knee's fixed. Naturally. Didn't need PRP injections, no surgery, nothing. Just by having confidence and trust in the process. And now, dude, she can walk, she can dance. Well, she, didn't, was, she was able to walk like five minutes and then she would have to sit or like rest. Now she can walk half an hour, one hour, she can dance, right? And sometimes we have to literally force people to transform. Like that kid with the Coca-Cola bottle in, at OXO, I don't think he can be convinced like so, so what I'm really asking is, from your firsthand experience, not just from a health perspective, but how do people transform? What is the, what are the underpinnings, the, 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 the foundation of transformation? What is it? Like, for my mom, was it like I had to put my ego into it? Like, I got to win if my mom doesn't transform, then I lose. So is it like something where you, you, you use a dark side or is it love? <laughs> like what, what is the underlying stuff that can transform people? Well, I developed a theory while listening to you talk. <laughs> um, we all know, uh, people like the kid with the Coke bottles and like your mom that are just kind of floating through life. Uh, not really seem to be striving or that interested in even generating more information and making different decisions. And then, of course, we know people like ourselves that are constantly on this quest to optimize. And, you know, I imagine um, thinking about myself when I was young and thinking about other people that I know uh, that are like this. I think it has to do with um, potential, meaning if you feel like you have potential, like as a kid, um, you know, I felt like a, a normal kid, but I felt like I had potential. I felt like I was, mm -hmm. I could, I could go on to do like pretty good things if I put my mind to it. It was just a kind of a, a feeling, you know? Um, and that, I think that provides the motivation to, okay, I want to tap into my best self. And then think about someone who just feels like, all right, this is my lot in life. You know, this is what it is. I'm not, I don't have like, whether it's learned or whether they keep, they're just wired like that, but they're not really thinking like they're going to improve. Um, so they don't have any desire, you know, like your mom, like you were saying, like, she's not thinking it's even possible. So like, why even try? Whereas if she had this vision board of like her, thinner and healthier and felt like it was something that she could accomplish, then that motivation would just come from within. She wouldn't need you to like take over like that. Where does potential come from though? I mean, honestly, I think it's uh it's, it's a feeling, right? Like you, you need to be, everyone has potential, right? Like we all have probably more potential uh, than we realize, but certain people, you know, um, again, I'll just use myself as an example, but this could be any number of my friends, um, but kind of grew up like a little tall, a little, you know, not super bright, but like pretty on point. Um, 
showed talent in the arts at a young age, um, had uh, physical gifts, um, got validated, got rewarded, got encouraged. Um, and just intrinsically, I just felt like I was a special kind of guy. And everyone around me kind of had a similar feeling. So I didn't need to motivate myself to improve. Like there was no like me needing to look in the mirror and be like, Hey Val, you need to get your shit together. Like it was just constant striving to improve. And I think it was cause I was just genuinely curious to see like what I could do. Like, I just want to know, I want to, you know, squeeze as much out of these little gifts that I have. Um, and then. Yeah, I think it, it's just natural. So if you've got a little bit of something special, whatever it is, whether it's mental gifts, physical gifts, whether it's just great training, great upbringing, whatever it is, um, that that feeling of like, oh, I could I could accomplish some some great things. Uh, I want to know if if I can and how how well I can do, and then that that motivates you, understanding that you have potential. I'll, I'll I'll give it to you another way. Yeah, because it it won't really apply to my mom because no, my mom has been validated since she was a kid. They used to call her Papu. Papu is like a, you know, this like, um, really beautiful, uh, girl who's like very bright and everyone loves her. It's called Papu. They all call her Papu, right? And when she became uh, married, they called her Buddy Bye, which is like the big, the big, uh, the big sister, the the. The, the caretaker of the family, buddy bye. Okay. And uh, so she has always been the leader of the family and been responsible. And, you know, she brought us up in America when they were, we didn't know anybody and like we didn't even have any income. And, you know, we just grew up like from, from scratch. So the, the love and validation my mom has had forever since she was a kid. And, and even though, even more than that is, She's always lived around like my grandmother, my aunt, my other aunt. So, dude, like when I'm at their place, she's getting a call like every two hours by somebody. And she picked. So the social love, the connection is all there. But the motivation of getting her health yeah. proper, it wasn't even something that she would have considered. Right. Yeah, I think those are two different things. Like getting that uh, social validation and that love and affection, of course, is incredibly important. But that's uh, very separate from feeling like you have potential with your health, um, like physical potential. Uh -huh. So remember I was saying like around seven years ago, I kind of hit a little bit of a, a spot with my career. So I actually felt what it was like after 17 years of striving, like I was saying, I was like obsessed with it. Why was I obsessed with it? Because I felt like I had all this potential. Um, I wanted to like, you know, hit at the, the ceiling of what I could be capable of. When that happened, I went, as I indicated, I went through a period, but I don't know that I really kind of uh, explained like how challenging that period was. But the gist of it is the person that I was that was constantly striving, like going to the gym, doing whatever it would take meditation, yoga, things that I don't like or, or don't come naturally to me to try and optimize and be better. That person started very slowly kind of, I don't want to say dying, but like hibernating. Um, and it was like, uh, I didn't know it at the time, but like, I'm pretty sure I was depressed, right? Like it was at the time I just had spent my entire life, this happy go lucky kind of like person. So it was more like years later when I look back at it, I'm like, oh, I was like at least moderately depressed. Um, I stopped, stopped working out, um, stopped giving a fuck, essentially. Like caring less about my work translated to caring less about my life. Eventually I got back on track and, um, you know, I never like lost confidence that I would, but that period went on way longer than I would have thought that it would have. And in that period, 
I watched myself and I'm still in a way kind of recovering from it now. Like I actually watched myself go from this highly motivated, uh, highly driven and ambitious person to someone that like didn't really care, you know, like just didn't give a flying fuck about anything, you know, just kind of floating along, you know, like, like the kid with the Coke bottles, uh, ordering pizza, like just not giving two fucks, like drinking, doing things that like never, I would never even have thought like what was a thing that I would do. Um, but it was because, uh, you know, I, I didn't have anything to strive for. I wasn't feeling challenged. I didn't have a purpose. I didn't see any potential. Like I, I was like, well, potential for what? I don't know. Um, so the reality is I'll never have that feeling that I had when I was in my kind of like late twenties, early thirties, where I was just like ready to take a bite out of life. I was just like, I'm going to rip this puppy a new one. Um, those will probably always be the most inspired and ambitious time in my life. Um, but I've regained at least, uh, you know, like a desire to improve and like see what I can do with this next chapter of my life. Um, but I share that just to explain that like you could have it and lose it and get it back. You know, that desire to, to be your best. It's literally something that, uh, I feel like it just came naturally to me because I saw so much potential when I didn't feel like I had any potential it naturally started to go away. And now that I'm older and I am very self-aware and I can like look at my own behavior and thoughts, I, you know, needed to force myself to bring it back, knowing that that's what makes me tick. That's part of my identity. It's like, if I'm not trying to be my best, I'm not a happy camper. So it's like a fundamental. Got it. The moments when you have been down in life, where you were demotivated and you kind of maybe needed an external push or some voice, inner voice, to talk to you and get you back on track. Let's shift uh, towards something more deeper, which is depression, right? The basic proponent of, or, or the, the, the basic main component of depression is when you have given up and you are in such despair that this hope is zero of anything, right? That's depression 101. And I'm interested to know what can happen in a person's life or what can a person do, perhaps a hack, to allow him the best chance to not be in depression. And I'm assuming most people don't want to be depressed because, and, and, and again, thank God I haven't experienced hardcore depression ever. Thank God. Maybe it's like my brain wiring or some neurochemicals are like, okay. And, uh, I don't have the propensity for that perhaps. But I also know that life can throw anything at me which will put me into depression. Anything can happen in life. You know, I'm a human, mm -hmm. right? I have the same brain as anyone else. And I know from, there was, uh, have you heard of Harry Harlow? No. Have you heard? So Harry Harlow is the guy in the 60s, a little bit in the 50s, but mostly in the 60s and 70s, who did the social isolation experiments. Okay. So he was at the University of Wisconsin, and what he would do is he would keep a, a rhesus macaque monkey alone for months. And I mean no physical contact. He would not see another monkey. All he would see are gloves bringing him food real quick. And then they eventually figured out how to give him food without even seeing gloves, right? So it's like solitary confinement, mm -hmm. total isolation. And, and there's a bunch of findings from that study, but there's a particular variant of this study where he put monkeys in what he called the pit of despair. It was this vertically, you know, you imagine like a vertical cylinder box and the monkeys down here and on the top is a, a wire mesh covering. And they can see other monkeys? They can't see anything. Okay. They can't see anything. They climb up 
and all they see is wire, but they can't break through it. It's a very strong wire. And these are children monkeys. They're, they're just like very, very small monkeys. They're like a few months old. They go up, they try to break, they can't, they go back down. They go back up again, try to break, they can't, they go back up down, uh, back down. And in a matter of a few days, they give up. And they just stay down there. Now, what's another derivative of this study is when they didn't do this from childhood, they took a happy monkey, really outgoing monkey, fit, <laughs> fit, healthy, uh, energetic, loving, playing, totally normal. Put them into the pit of despair. Same thing. Four days, learned helplessness. Right. He's done. And then when they reintroduced the monkey to society, mm -hmm. and he had problems. Never the same. He would he would you know cower up, cover himself. He would do these rocking behaviors, this autistic type behaviors. Yeah, yeah. Right. He was scared. He was he was cringing. He was shaking. Scared to maybe go back in the pit of despair. Yeah. Yeah. Traumatized. Yeah. And then they 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 figured out how to because for Harry Harlow, his he wanted to devise an experiment where he could know for sure that the monkey is depressed. Mm. Like clinical depression as we know it in humans. He wanted to put have a monkey go through that. And this is how he achieved it. It wasn't like isolation uh, or, 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 or like, you know, isolation for a few months. It wasn't enough. It had to be that the monkey tries to get out and he can't. Tries to get out. It's like continuous failure towards something that you desperately want, which is to get out of here. And the way they figured this out in the monkeys is step-by-step -step introduction to different sensory stimulation. So the first step was let the monkey just see other monkeys, but not touch them and not see them all day. See for an hour or two, right? Exposure therapy, essentially. And then the second day would be, okay, now the, he was going to watch these little kids playing with their mothers. And then the third day, and then slowly, 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 the monkeys got back to normal, but not anywhere where they used to be. Not, mm -hmm. you know, you can still Just tell. To function. So what, from your own firsthand experience or perhaps secondhand experience from friends and family, when we have a state of learned helplessness where we are in a pit of despair. What can we do or what can we do for others to help them get out of it? And the question I want to ask before that is, how can we identify someone in the pit of despair? Because sometimes we don't know. People sometimes appear, Robin Williams, the guy hung himself, man, right? Sometimes people appear happy, making jokes, being comedians, stars, celebrities, mm -hmm. and then you find out, oh, they hung themselves from a fan in their hotel, right? Happened to Anthony Bourdain, right? Others we know in, in, in... So have you discovered or realized a way to identify depression because if we can, then maybe we can help these people. Huh. So in the men's group that I was telling you about, uh, something that I've learned from listening to other men discuss what's on their mind, their challenges, their problems, is that uh, you mentioned uh, depression is like feeling like giving up uh, or like hopelessness. Um, I imagine there's a spectrum there, right? There's like full-blown depression, like I can't win. And there's like, hmm, what is it all for? You know, in a minor way. So I would say that each one of these men, including myself, are all suffering from some form of depression. Yes. It might be incredibly mild, but we all seem to be at different stages or different extremes or variations of wondering what our our purpose and our passion is and how can we 
maintain it. Maybe we had it and we lost it. Maybe we've never had it, but we want to find it. But like that commonality is, is really, really clear that everyone is looking to find that passion and that purpose. Um, and then of course, thinking about myself when I was my most passionate and when I was not very passionate and listening to my brother's stories, uh, I just come back to getting good at something. Um, and I don't think you need to worry too much about what it is at first. You just want to start doing something. So it could just be like, I want to learn chess. I want to learn jujitsu. Um, it could be anything. It could be a full on career move. You know, I, I want to learn how to design websites, whatever. Um, and you keep doing it and dedicate yourself to it, even though it's hard, just like the, the young, um, athlete, uh, going to practice and doing drills. Like it's not, it's fun and you know, it's fun when you're playing, but like the drills aren't that fun. Um, but it becomes fun because they get validation. They get some wins. They, they get, uh, it's different from the validation that your mom got of like, I love you. You're amazing. You're such a lovely person. Mm -hmm. It's validation. Like, oh, like I am actually good at this. This makes me feel good. This makes me want to put in the effort, even though the effort might not be fun in the moment because I desire this outcome. Um, like an obvious one would be, I guess I'll just thinking about myself, um, like awards and, um, you know, just, uh, just being awarded things was like a big thing for me. Um, and that, that just, that's fuel. Uh, so like with all of these guys and I have a lot of young, young guys that kind of hit me slide into my DMs on Instagram because they think. I'm living some awesome life or something, which of course I'm not, it's a, it's a big facade, but they're like, how do I get your life, bro? Like what's, what, what is the secret sauce? Or like, how do I become passionate? How do I find my passion? Like, it's all about trying to find your passion. And I would say, just pick something. Like the important thing is to start, do not spend months or years strategizing about what the, your passion is or what this thing is. Um, just to like, you know, start on something and you can always start small on just like, I want to get good at fucking nunchucks, whatever, just get good at something, get that validation and that feeling, make it something that you can share on the internet so that you get the validation, the encouragement that isn't like just people like friends being like, good job, Billy, but like actual, you know, you could understand that you have potential in this and, um, and then, and I feel like then, then the passion and the purpose and all that, it just like, woo, 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 like dominoes, it just kind of like flows out. Um, mastery. Yeah. Goals for mastery. I mean, worked for me. Uh, I was lucky. I had a natural propensity for design and the visual arts. So there was no big, like secret thing that I had to figure out. It was obvious what I was going to do. Um, but you know, looking back at it, like, was I so super talented naturally or did I just kind of get good at it and I kept getting validated, which made me want to get better at it. And like, when I look back, I was actually super dedicated. I was like a machine. Like I thought about it all day. Um, I was, was I really a natural talent or was I just like a really hard worker? And why was I such a hard worker? I think because I was getting, I was in that positive loop of like, you know, success of like that validation, hard work pays off right on. This feels good. More hard work. Keep going. Um, yeah. And as well as I can tell, the best way to create that loop, to get that loop going is just start dedicating yourself to getting really, really good at something. Uh, a great one of course is, uh, your body, like go, go to the gym and make it your new mission in life to uh, be as physically fit as possible. Uh, it's an easy one to get validation on. It's an easy one to make you feel great. It's obviously great for you. Um, and then once you start having those wins, you just start feeling like a champ. Like before you know it, you're like, Hey, I'm special. I'm good. I'm good at this. And you want to apply that to other things. That's my theory, at least. I wonder, 
I wonder if that's a trick, though. Because getting good at something perhaps makes you dependent on the thing. So, simple example is uh, this concept of are you enough, right? This is a, everyone struggles with this. Like last night we were at uh, Brazilian Zouk. It's like a, this dance thing. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember way, way, way years ago when I did my first salsa class or when I would uh, dance at some wedding or some at some function. I wasn't like crazy insecure, right? And um, now I've done it so many times that it's like, it's not appearing to me that do I look good? Like it, it doesn't even appear because mm -hmm. now it's like, let's play and have fun. Confident. And uh, move and flow with the music. That's it. But I can feel the fear in other people, right? I can see it in their eyes. I can see it in their movements. And I wonder how someone could be truly free if they are dependent on being good at something for their well-being. Because, like, when I was deep into academia, my neuroscience career was like everything. Mm -hmm. Right? It's like, oh, who are you? Oh, I'm a scientist. But I'm not a scientist. I mean, it's a label. It's a title. <laughs> right? I know what I am. I can feel it. And that's it. It's nothing, no label. So how... I love the mastery thing. I feel it every day. Like, I mean, just a podcast. Like, this is this is mastery for me. I want to... And, and again, I don't know what's going to happen to this podcast. I have no idea. But it feels good. It feels very aligned. And... But I am very careful when it comes to validation. So, for example, I don't read any comments. Never. I just refrain from it. Because I don't want that feedback, positive or negative, to affect the inner drive to do things which I already want to do. So, yes, in the past... Right when I would publish a paper validation, oh shit! You, oh, it was we were in the news, man. They they give us this award, and we were in this newspaper, and you know the research is out, and people know about it. I got massive validation. I would go to a scientific conference, and people would come up to me like, "Hey, I know you're about to finish your PhD. Do you want to come work at my lab?" You know, he would like pitch to me, right? And I would get this famous people asking me questions, and be like, "Wow, this is validation." But now that I look back, I was engrossed in having something external represent me. And now that, yes, I'm, I still have that and it's still in me, but it doesn't seem natural to depend on external validation. So how... So it, it's hard for me to, 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 to buy into that because if you seek it and you are going towards mastery, then if you encounter an obstacle, the validation won't be enough to keep making you drive forward. There has to be something fundamental about a human, some human's nature that is part of that purpose. I, I agree. Uh, I think it's um, maybe the way I stated it is uh, validation is kind of like helping you along the way. But I think in terms of like human's purpose, like what do we really want? We want to contribute, right? So let's say you achieve mastery at something, but you're not contributing to anything bigger than yourself. Like you're not going to be motivated. You're not going to feel like you have potential. But if you're actually 
participating in something that others impacts other people, right? So again, thinking about myself, yeah, awards were great. That was a thing that encouraged me, but it wasn't what I was striving for. I wasn't working hard for the award. The award is just a nice thing. What I loved about it is I was creating software and creating advertising campaigns that were touching hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives, you know, just, just knowing that, right? Like we are, we are a tribe, like humans, we, we want to contribute with our, our work, whatever we do, we want to somehow contribute to the overall tribe. So I think the, yeah, I, I maybe put the emphasis on the wrong place. Like as long, like if you get really good at something and that thing is impacting others, whether you get the validation in the form of like likes and comments or awards or whatever, it's not the validation. It's the fact that you're contributing to, to whatever that is. Okay. So the likes and comments may be a physical manifestation of that. Yeah. But it, it's not the thing. It's not the thing, but it, it allows you to be like, oh, I'm actually impacting other humans. I'm like contributing or at the very least, like my existence matters. Got it. Um, I also want to ask you about creativity. Sure. Because um, as a designer now of software, and before it was more websites and branding and now it's software, mm -hmm. is there a creative process or in any any specific routine that you are involved in every day or multiple times a day, certain times of the day, which gets you in the zone of creativity. Because most of my creative theory I got from Stephen Pressfield, mm. you know, The War of Art, mm -hmm. and uh, I've watched a lot of his stuff and, and really great, you know, calling the muse. And, you know, he believes that we don't create it, we, it's created through us and you know, from the universe. And so, what is your firsthand experience with creativity and how can one get in the zone of creating beautiful things that are original and like never existed before? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, as a lifelong professional creative, I have to get in the zone. I can't afford to just let it, let it happen when it wants to. Um, and, uh, for me, uh, the, the, the key is to think about the project, whatever it is, um, or a portion of the project and just break it down into as small pieces as possible. Almost like think of it as a Lego set. You want to like think of every little piece. So I'm not talking about like a to-do list, but basically like, this is what I need to accomplish. Okay. How many parts are there in order to accomplish this part? What do I need to do? Okay, I'm going to research this and that. Okay, I'm going to spend just a half a day sketching ideas. Okay, I'm going to spend two to three days fleshing them out, etc. And the more you can break it down into something that is like really piece by piece, it does two things. Uh, it avoids the classic creative trap, which is just, just go and just feel it out and let it happen or whatever. Um, but also it lets you wrap your head around it. I think the, one of the biggest challenges with creative projects is there's, there's so much to it. It can be almost a little overwhelming. Um, and then once you start, you're just like, ugh, you don't even know how much more you have to go. It's kind of like this open box of like, is this going to take me the rest of the day or the rest of the week? Like, I can't tell because every time you do something, it creates two or three new problems that you need to solve. And it's very easy to go off on tangents and like chasing a rabbit over here. And then like, oh no, it just didn't get anything done this afternoon or whatever. Um, so spending that upfront time of like having a plan, you know, just for yourself. Um, so you know what, what you're going to spend your attention on. And if your attention starts to waver, you can be like, what was I focused on? Oh yeah. Okay. Back to that. And then that allows me to think of my day in terms of like, okay, what do I want to accomplish today? What's, how am I going to break it up? All right, here we go. Whereas when I just sit down and I just start to work, I can f find it very challenging to get into a super focused zone. Um, because it's just so 
nebulous. It's just like unclear, um, which is fine if you're like doing a painting for yourself. But if you're like doing work that needs to be done, whether it's for yourself or someone else, but you really want it to be intelligent and you want to do it in the most efficient way possible, just breaking it apart and wrapping your head around it before before you begin. And then I do that like at the beginning of every single day. And I find doing that allows me to slide into that super deep work focus state because I know what to expect. I know there's a beginning, a middle, and an end as opposed to just kind of like jumping in and seeing where it takes me. Gotcha. And I, I love that you mentioned the deep work concept multiple times today. <laughs> Right and Cal Newport's idea, yeah. you know, deep work and all of his all of his work, which I love so much. Most people today don't live a deep life at all, right? Most people are kind of like going to work, taking care of the kids. Um, they're stressed from they're in traffic for hours every day, right? There is no and there is no chance of any depth in their life, right? They're on stimulants. They're, they're on painkillers, they're on prescription medicine, right? Like my grandmother, I think she takes like 30 pills a day, something like that. And I, and, and, and it's funny because she has this, uh, this strip of a really cute little container mm -hmm. and, and she's like nicely color coded, like, yeah, dude. So she'll like open it up and she's like, oh, I gotta take these. And it's like one, one time I was, uh, dry, when I was in, when we were in Euless, she lives in Euless in Texas. And uh, we were driving her to uh, her, um, I think it was a gastro or internal medicine, like one of the seven doctors she sees. And as I was driving her, Martha was in the back and, and Nani was in, near me in the front. And uh, she was literally bragging about how many doctors she has. She's like, oh, seven doctors take care of me. I don't think that's something to be proud of. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she was just proud that she lives in the Western world. And she is. can afford it. Yeah, she is proud of, she's immensely proud of that. And, and it's just, some people are pulled by responsibility since they were young, right? Like my nanny, she raised four daughters and, you know, they grew up in a, in a poor family. So they were basically wrapping peppermint a candy as kids. Like, so, so my, my nanny, my grandmother, my mom and her sisters, three sisters, them five would wrap peppermint candies all day manually to make money. They'd have to wrap like uh, 400 each or something. I, I don't know what, what the numbers were, but they had the quota and they each have to wrap 400 and then the person would take the candy and sell it and they would make their money. So this is the poverty where, how they grew up and for someone like that to go through life and now let's say they're in their old age, but then maybe they get a curiosity like my mom, for example, right? She's in, in her sixties now. And now her and my dad, you know, they go to the gym every day. They, they, they study YouTube videos for like apple cider vinegar stuff and, mm -hmm. and, and like, they're interested. you know, right. They somehow found potential like you which you said potential in them and my dad tells me this all the time he's like farhan mom is a different person now like awesome. this is crazy how, how she's become she's like a different person like she's motivated she's like excited and curious it probably all started with seeing uh, that she could handle her health and now she knows she's capable of something Right. It's like what you were saying with uh, you achieved a level of mastery with dancing. You're not thinking about it. You're loving the podcast, the confidence that comes from dancing and all the other things that you've done well your entire life leads you to believe that you're going to be very good at this. And you and it's like a domino effect, right? So your mom's probably experiencing a version of that. Just getting good at something um, and and having that thing ideally contribute to other people I think even if it's small, it just it's like a virus that grows in people, giving them that that hope and that motivation. Yeah, yeah. Going back to creativity, some people genuinely believe that they are not creative, and they've been put that in their head, because 
And I, I remember watching Jordan Peterson once, and he was saying that a very small percentage of the population is actually creative. Hmm. Not like, oh, you, you, you wrote some song or something, but he basically came up with metrics or someone, not him, but someone came up with metrics of what is creative. And you, there's this long uh, page of questions, right? Like, how many songs have you written? How many books have you written? And how many, right? There's like all the whole list of things. That's not so important as, 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 uh, as, as the question, which is, is every human being potentially creative? Or is it that the human species has been given a few seeds of creativity in, as, as certain mutations of, you know, someone with Asperger's syndrome or someone with uh, a certain other, you know, bipolar disorder, like there, there's, or, or a schizophrenia or OCD, right? We've been given certain mutations which allow people to emerge as creative. But then we, but, but it's not like, it's something lucky. It's some, something fortunate. Or can creativity be cultivated in an individual and then they become like hyper-creative? Yeah, 100%. It can be cultivated. Um, there's, uh, creativity is basically just lateral thinking. It's just going down different avenues and there are formulas to it. Um, there are people that have a, a propensity to think creatively, just like there's people that have a propensity for math, but we can all learn math. Just some people are going to have an easier go of it. It's going to come much more naturally. So same thing with creativity. Um, there's a book, um, the author Austin Cleon, uh, called Steal Like an Artist. Yeah. He has two books like that. Yes. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And the foundation of the book is really the ultimate hack for creativity. The theory is that nothing is truly brand new, like nothing. Every once in a while, someone comes along, some artist, musician, something, comes up with a new sound. And everyone's like, oh my God, this person like invented a new sound or this painter invented a new style or whatever. But really what it is, is they're combining mm -hmm. things that they've seen and that other artists have done. And it's kind of like a DJ, you know, mixing songs and they like take these two good songs and they make a new song out of mixing them. Um, and that's what uh, kind of creative people have known forever. What they figure out at some point in your career is that there's formulas to this. Uh, they're not obvious, they're not written down, but the formula is get, becoming a tastemaker, basically becoming so good at um, like what good art is or whatever it is for your profession, like what makes it good that you can select your inspiration. So let's say I'm starting a new project. It's a piece of software, which has elements of creativity to it, but also highly technical and very logical. Um, but it's the creative, it's the conceptual portion. And I, I, how am I going to approach it? Am I going to sit in front of blank computer and just start like, you know, sketching? I might do that for a little bit, but I'm actually going to go seek inspiration. And then the, the power and the creativity there is identifying what is well suited to this project that I'm working on, gathering it all, and then taking the portions from each one and creating something new with it. So like I'm inspired by this overall layout. I'm inspired by the interaction of this, this module and these buttons. I'm inspired by the the color palette or like the sense of depth this look and feel i'm inspired by how this form is laid out it's very similar to the challenge that i'm gonna have taking those little bits and like frankensteining them into something new that feels new to other people uh and feels very creative and you know arguably it was but the, the creativity was a process so, and yes anyone could learn that process you do need to get good at the curation of that inspiration. That's so cool. Lateral thinking. Yeah. I mean, what is creativity? It's just be thinking, right? It's, it's not having to follow, you know, you think of the least creative job, like accounting or something like that, right? Something that's just pure 
numbers. Um, you know, you follow steps. It's a order, you know, creativity is just like being comfortable with chaos and having thoughts, like letting one thought lead to another, lead to another, lead to another, and not being sure where it's going to go. And then maybe circling back and, and connecting thoughts. I call it lateral thinking, just meaning, um, yeah, creative thinking. There, there is no step-by-step. Step. Yeah. Like pattern recognition, seeing things, because this is something I learned from Rick Rubin, mm. right? Rick, Rick did a multiple podcasts because he published this book, The Creative Way. Um, I have, I have it on the shelf here. And he said that you have to determine what you notice that other people don't. There's stuff that you know you can feel. Other people don't see it. That's your creativity. Because perhaps that's a part of lateral thinking. Because if you can, if you can recognize, it's like uh, when, you know, see someone like Einstein, right? Like, wow, mm -hmm. right? He's like, okay, you know, he looks at the train and then he's looking, okay, he's considering the speed of light and he's looking at mass and energy. Like it's all these things and mm -hmm. the cosmos and little particles. And he's like, oh, that's, that's how they work together. Mm -hmm. That would be the ultimate example of creative thinking right there. He's not following a step-by-step -step process. He's looking at multiple things and identifying the connection, the theme. Matt, do you believe that lateral thinking can be honed through certain protocols, exercises, hacks? Yeah, I don't know if I would call them hacks. I would say uh, time, time in the trenches, creation, like the act of creation. Um, so like whether it's, uh, you know, for myself, it's usually very visual. So constructing a photograph would be an exercise in creative thinking, um, thinking laterally, uh, getting inspired by different things. What do you want it to look like? What's the overall composition going to be? What's your color palette going to be? What's the mood going to be? Is it going to be lifestyle or is it going to be still life or is it going to be something else? Um, the more you go through that, the better you're going to get at that, that identifying of those patterns. I don't know if there's like a, a hack hack. Um, it would be repetition. Got it. And now going back to uh, something we discussed before about men's circles. The community aspect uh, in life, right? So for example, here in Tulum, we have digital jungle, jungle gym, et cetera, et cetera, right? Community. Where, what aspect does community play in your life? now earlier and what is the what is the advantage of community in building your creativity mm. interesting question um so i have been a little bit of an anomaly i suppose in that i've always been an outgoing person like i like talking to people have no issue with making new friends uh, but also, oddly, um, I've never put that much emphasis on community. Um, I think maybe I've also just been fortunate in that I find myself a part of a community, and then it just seems like it just happens really easily. Um, so that that would be my hack for that, is like be a part of a community. Like um, Digital Jungle is a perfect example, you know, like going to a place every day where you're going to, run into the same people, you're going to build a, a community. Um, but yeah, it's, I've, I'm kind of a loner to be honest. Like I have been a little bit my whole life. I'm more of a like two, three, like besties kind of person than like a, a larger sort of network. And I don't know that that's necessarily a good thing. Like, um, it's just sort of my, my attitude, um, but like certainly the larger your network and the bigger community, um, the more opportunities you're going to get. I don't know. I've just always saw it as a distraction. Uh -huh. I think I was just so like, uh, I think I might be a modern version of the tortured artist 
meaning like if it was the 17th century and we were in France, I'd be one of these dudes cutting off his ear and like smearing it on a canvas or something. Like I would usually rather like hang out working on my art than being at the pub with the dudes or whatever. Um, I've just always been more into my work than cultivating, um, you know, a community. Um, yeah, but I know other people, it's hugely important. It's like, um, you know, they, they don't exist without it, without some sort of community. Like I have many friends, uh, especially like digital nomads that travel, that that's all they live for, um, is just to hang out with their friends and build those connections and keep in those bonds. Uh, very different from myself. So I think my answer would be, I think it, in, it served me well in terms of getting good at my craft. You know, like talked about repetition and, and putting, doing the exercises, putting in the reps. My, the, the way that I am where I kind of default to focusing on my craft over building deep connections with random people that may or may not be around for very long. Uh, I think that's, that's done well for me. Um, although the older I get, the more I do appreciate them, the more I feel like, okay, like I don't want to be like this my whole life. Uh, I want to be a little bit of a normie. I kind of actually like care about other people. Um, even if it's not a transactional relationship, which I think historically has kind of usually been my thing is like, we're, we're helping each other somehow. And if we're not, then why are we even talking? Uh-huh. Um, but I know that's not how like many people operate. So, um, I'm trying to stay true to myself, but also maybe kind of, uh, integrate more with society. In a subconscious way, it probably is like that. Transactional. Yeah. In, in some way. It may not be conscious, but you know, it's, it's hard to become friends with someone if you don't deep down inside see a gain. Right. And maybe that gain is just, um, you know, you're lonely and this person is, is being there and you're providing the same thing for them. Um, so that's, it's a transaction of sorts. Um, but yeah, in, in my time, I found that the people that I know that just, that don't have that kind of thing, it's like going back to like one of the themes of this conversation of like that sense of like, I do this. And you know, I, I was saying like, you have to do something really well. Maybe you don't have to really like do it really well. It's more about that. I'm contributing to the overall tribe. Like I'm doing something that is affecting other people. If, if they have something that they do like that, those people to me seem like the most content. And I know myself when I'm really on fire with that, that's when I'm the most content. And then all of my friends that are more, they don't have a thing, like they have a job and they do it for money. And when they're not doing that, they're trying to go on adventures. Like they're going on hikes and they're having fun with their friends. They're going out, having drinks, going to the beach, whatever, good times, but, uh, not actually accomplishing anything, just sort of kind of passing time a little bit. Uh, and having a lot of people float in and out of their lives and so on. Um, those ones, the, when we do get really close and have really deep conversations, I feel like I often identify that like deep down, they're not, not too pumped. They're actually, uh, they're almost doing that because it's, they don't want to face reality a little bit. There's something like they're really concerned about in their life that they don't really want to deal with. And part of a way of like not having to deal with it is to just kind of keep the good times rolling. Uh, that's a great point, man. Cause when I, I remember still in Montreal when I was doing my PhD and I just did that. That's all I did. Right. It's like all the friends were lab people who I talked to, like my colleagues, mm -hmm. my boss, mice, monkeys, <laughs> <It's> <laughs> monkeys. yeah, macaques, the same with the, the Harry Harlow ones. And, um, I remember that, you know, those seven years I was just working and it's interesting because I never felt a lack of anything. It's almost like the work itself was my community. Mm -hmm. Like those people were my people, but then I figured out that they're not really my people, but the actual 
job, the, the experiments, the programming, the analysis, the publishing papers, the going to conferences, that itself replaced any friendship. But I guess maybe it's just a personality thing. Like that's perhaps a personality where you can immerse yourself in work because you love it fully. And then there is no need for drinks and uh, parties and going out. I think uh, there's a happy medium. Okay. Um, I think like a, a balance, as with most things, balance is, is usually the way to go. Um, I'm reminded of some people um, that I've met, like some very, very special humans. They seem to be able to be very focused on the work and be very driven and, and put the thought and time into that. And then they can shift modes and just be very present and just be hanging out with their family or hanging out with their friends. You know, I always used to think it was, you're like one or the other. You're one of these sort of, not ignorant, but just people that are just floating along, like not too worried about tomorrow or whatever, um, but kind of jealous of those people because they're like sort of just happy and like living in the moment. And it's a bit of a burden to be someone that's like constantly strategizing and considering every, you know, potential outcome. Um, and between the two, I suppose I'd rather be the one that thinks more. Uh, but then again, I'm kind of jealous of these people that, you know, it seems like they have pretty good lives in a way. Um, but I have encountered people that are like CEOs running businesses and definitely like have that spark. Um, but they've just mastered, like maybe this is one of the like keys to life is this ability to just almost flip a switch wow. and be like, okay, like I'm, I'm just glad to be here kind of energy and, and soak that up and enjoy that because it is enjoyable. Yeah. Um, but then also go back into their like, oh, you know, brilliant mind or whatever, the, you know, construct whatever they're doing. Yeah. I totally resonate with that. I've done that in a circadian way. So when I wake up in the morning until around 7 p.m., it's work mode. It's like, let's do this. Let's read. Let's publish. Let's record. Let's communicate. But then at 7, I switch my phone to airplane mode. No excuses. It doesn't matter how where work is. It, it's irrelevant. And then it's relax time. Right? So... I, as in the morning, you see sunlight, you know, to wake up, you take a cold bath or you do an ice bath, whatever. You wake up, you get your dopamine, right? You get that, that, uh, that high vibration of work and being motivated to create stuff. But then in the evening, it's relax time. Listen to music, dance a little bit, dinner, watch a, a bit of a movie. And I feel that for me, that you know, the, the, the peaks and troughs of, of life is, uh, is very healthy. Right. Whereas it wasn't like that before. I would be working all day, right? I would wake up till night, literally till I go to bed, I'm doing something, shut my computer, I sleep. Now it's like, no, no, we, we tone down. Move in waves. Yeah. <laughs> and, and for me, th this is very sustainable. Sure. It's very healthy because it's not like I'm going to burn out. There's no way to burn out because like I'm calming myself down every night and de-stressing myself, meditation, right, breath work. It's just, uh, you know, it's night. Yeah, yeah. What time do you wake up? Four. Four a.m.? Okay, so you, if... Eight to four. Some may say that uh, like four a.m. to seven p.m., is actually still pretty unbalanced. That's a lot of work day. <laughs> um, yeah. you know, you're... But it's balanced for me. Okay. It's balanced for me. Because even during the day, if there is a, let's say we have to bike to foodie to get some food, right? Or we have to bike to um, uh, get coconut water, right? That is an adventure that I am very present, mm -hmm. right? Like we have this saying, um, we ask each other all the time, we say, are you here? Hey, are you here? And that's a question of, are you present? You're here with me? You're here? Or are you here? And usually what happens is whenever I ask her, are you here? I'm not. And I just got, I, I just became present. So now I'm asking her. 
Mm. Right? So she'll either say, I am. Or she'll be like, I am now. Mm -hmm. Right? So we keep each other here and feeling the beauty of earth and the sky and the sun and the, the birds chirping and our bodies feeling the universe. And we bring ourselves back. So these little adventures, so it's not like four to seven work, work, work. It's like four to seven is the motivation of doing things. And then the last, you know, seven to eight, six to eight, it's, it's usually like between six and seven. Seven might be a, a bit harsh, but like six to eight is uh, toned down, like two hours, toned down, relax, and then do nothing. Just be. And that, um, I mean, even at eight, when we go to bed, we're still like reading, reading some, I, I'm reading Gulag Ar Archipelago, uh, the, the story of Stalin's prisons in the Soviet Union. You're reading for enjoyment though. You're not reading for some sort of production or outcome. I am not getting any enjoyment out of that book. <laughs> <laughs> like, and this is your evening reading? It's probably the hardest book I've ever read. And, okay. and I, right before this book, I read Crime and Punishment. Wow. And uh, that was, uh, it was easy compared to this book. So it's the way it's written. It's so intense. intense. It's like this case, and then he goes into details about like, okay, this is how the, the bribes happen. And that's when the mother came in with this much money. And then, then the, the, the police said no. And then, you know, she, she said they agreed to an amount. And then she brought like a third of that just to like, just to get away with it, to, to yeah, not yeah. pay the amount. requires full concentration. Oh, man, it's hard. It's probably the hardest person I've ever read. Solzhenitsyn is his name, Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the guy who wrote Gulag Archipelago. And um, the beginning of the book was awesome. It was so much fun because he was talking about, like, torture and, you know, uh, uh, interrogation techniques. There's these, like, 27 uh, torture techniques that the Soviets had in them. Sounds fun. Yeah, it was it was it was totally fun, man. I was like, oh shit, <laughs> the damn sleep deprivation, holy shit, bed bugs, like <laughs> there's just all this insane stuff they have done, and so, I mean, the re the reason I'm reading this at night is because um, I've wanted to read this book for years, and I I always read like half of it and then I stopped, and then I again I would read half of it and then I would stop, for whatever reason. Um, same thing with Crime and Punishment. I tried to read it like three times. I never read the whole thing. And then I got the physical books. Oh. Huge. It's huge game changer for us, man. Like I went, so I went to, when we went to Euless, um, for my parents, you know, to help my mom. Then we came back. We were here for a while. And then every month or so I would go back to Austin and then my mom would come from Dallas and I would see her training just to make sure everything is okay. And one of those times I went back to Dallas and I flew from Dallas. But while I was there, my mom said, Farhan, uh, let's go to Barnes and Noble and get whatever books you want. It's like, what? This is like my lifelong dream. <laughs> like what? I could get physical books. And I'd already made this decision before that as I make a library of physical books, I will travel with them wherever I go. Okay. So if we were to leave Tulum, I would take that shelf with me. I would take all the books. I don't care if I have to pay for one check-in back, two check-in backs. It's, it's irrelevant. I'm going to take the books with me. Why? Because now these books represent a big part of my life. Because immersing myself in knowledge from the past, history, neuroscience, psychology, philosophy, it's so aligned with who I am. I feel so aligned when I'm reading something so interesting that someone else has done. Like it, it just changes the world for me. Mm -hmm. And, and, and I still remember I was at Barnes and Noble and I had my basket and I was just like, hey, I'll take this book. Oh, mom's going to pay. I don't give a shit. I'll take this. I'll take a dude. Like, because it's like, you know how women, they go shopping and they love, you know, yeah. I felt like that yeah, for the yeah. first time in my life. You're enjoying shopping <laughs> for books. Oh my God, man. So, um, and this physical is, book, because it's like, you've got it in your hand and like, you're going to take this with you. That that's what's allowed you to get through them. It's huge. Turning the page 
and feeling the paper. The, yeah. I don't know what the hell it is because I have, I've done Kindle hundreds of times. Same thing with audiobooks thousands of times. Right? Before I only did audiobooks. I was finished like two a week. Right. It was listing at 3x. Right. Right? And then one day, I read one of, um, I don't remember which book it was, but I read a physical book. And uh, I was like, wait a minute. The value transfer from this book to me is nothing like an audiobook. Maybe it's just the way I learn. Maybe it's just my learning ability. And then I made a pact. No more audiobooks. Never. Never going to read them. Just buy the book. If it's not available, figure out how to buy it. Ship it from somewhere. What about the ultimate advantage of the audiobook, which is you can do something else while listening to the book? I do it with podcasts. Okay. That's what I do. So when I'm brushing my teeth, I'm listening to Huberman every morning. Or when I'm uh, cleaning my eyes or, you know, with the morning stuff. Or when I'm flossing at night, it's Huberman. Doing the dishes, Huberman. Right? It's like when I'm setting up uh, like lights and all this, I'm listening to Huberman. And um, I think I have 20 episodes left and I'll be done with the whole thing. Everything that he's done, ever. So uh, how do you feel about Huberman then? <laughs> Pretty positive, I would say. Um, not, not the whole thing. Um, he has biases. Mm. Yeah. Really? Yeah. He seems like he is so, takes such care to kind of be like, I'm not biased this way or the other. 80%, I would say. 80% not biased. Like a simple example, his caffeine um, lecture. He takes caffeine. He's from Argentina. His dad's from Argentina. So he's biased towards Yerba Mate, right? And so he'll talk about uh, there's this GLT-1 uh, pathway that is activated. It's like an antioxidant pathway that's activated by caffeine, which is in your, it's a yerba mate uh, molecule that's in, it's in the, the caffeine in yerba mate. And, um, and, and, well, it's not in the caffeine, but it's, it's a part of the, the herbs. And he always mentions that. And in the talk, he didn't mention that, hey, for some people, like caffeine, you shouldn't have caffeine. Mm. Like what, for example, a lot of yogis, they don't drink coffee. A lot of spiritual people who are into meditation, they do not drink coffee. When I did the Vipassana meditation for 10 days retreat, they did not allow coffee. They didn't allow caffeine at all, right? Mm. So that part wasn't in the talk. So he wasn't even addressing the potential for not drinking caffeine. Of some Very sort. slight. Very slight, right? Another example, when he talks about Tonkata Lee, which is the main ingredient in Aphrodite, he says that the best quality Tonkata Lee is in Indonesia. Not true. It's in Malaysia. Because the, the climate, the growth of the tree, how much root is in the tree, that the strength of the actual herbs and how much the, the molecules in these herbs are that are effective for our bodies, they're in Malaysia. They're so not is that, is that a bias or he just doesn't, he's misinformed? It's a bias because he probably heard it or read it in a paper without going deep into it. Because a bias and misinformation, they could be similar. Because you could be biased towards something because you just didn't care to get more information. Sure. And it's, see, it's not the fact that he's wrong. It's the fact that he's confident in being wrong. Like he, the, the humility wasn't there. Because, I mean, I know this topic very well because I've been like sure. doing this for five years, right? Another thing uh, that happened in, a, in one of the episodes I just watched with Dr. Kyle Gillette, who is a hormone specialist, he mentioned that in Tonkat Ali, what you have to do is look at the uricominone content Uricominone is, is just like a peptide inside Tonkata Lee. And based on the percentage of uricominone in Tonkata Lee, you will know the strength of Tonkata Lee. Not true. Because if you, if you actually look at Tonkata Lee's, there's a, it's called the HPLC profile. It's basically like bands which show 
which peptides are present in the tongue catalyte that you're that you're measuring. Okay. They found that uricominone is actually toxic. Right? There's papers showing that this uricominone that people are trying to maximize is toxic. So you want to have the uricominone content low, not high. So Kyle Gillette, who's this like basic knowledge of Tom Cattell, he's like, oh yeah, uricominone. You want it to be as high as possible. You want you want to. And I was like, no, you don't. That's toxic. I know the farmer who's been studying Tom Cattell for forty years, who knows the local people in Malaysia who cut the roots of Tom Cattell, and he's done the studies in his own lab to show that uricominone is toxic. But it's just like people are going to listen to Isn't Kyle. that uh, normal? Like normal meaning, or aren't, do people not often mis, misquote the truth unintentionally? Um, and hopefully less so when it's science-based, but still unavoidable. Yeah. That's true. That's true. I, I don't know, man. I uh, I love Andrew Huberman. Don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm a I'm a fan. You know, I'm a like a crush. It's all you know for sure. And it's interesting because Andrew's grandfather, in in scientific lingo, mm -hmm. which is his boss's boss, is also linked through me. Yeah. So my boss is Chris Pack, who studied at Harvard, uh, Harvard Medical School, in postdoc. His boss was Marge Livingstone, who, whose boss was David Hubel, who is the Nobel Prize winner who discovered the, the, how the visual cortex works in, in, the, in the cat uh, and, then, uh, and the monkey. And uh, Huberman's boss, her boss is David Hubel. So we are linked through David Hubel's progeny. So this is it's like super cool. When I first wound up on listening to Huberman when I was first at Digital Jungle in Tulum, that's when I first started listening. I uh, looked up his uh, neuro tree, and his neuro tree is linked to David Hubel, just like mine. And I was like, "Oh, this is super cool. <laughs> I like this guy. Yeah, he's done. He's done good training." But uh, yeah, he's very likable. Yeah, yeah, he's a bit um, square. A bit square. Yeah, I mean, I feel it, like uh, he's the opposite, or at least what we imagine a uh, a scientist. I think he's holding a lot back, man. A so. lot back. Yes, he's way less squared than a scientist. No doubt about it. Like th that's you are 100% right. But the fact that he is controlled by Stanford, right? And he doesn't want to say things that are politically incorrect, even though he does believe it. Right. He won't say those things. So the fact that he's controlled and the fact that he is doesn't have freedom of speech, yeah, it's kind of sad. It is. Uh, he was just mentioning on the podcast with Tim Ferriss that uh, he's talking about psychedelics, and he was like, just a year or two ago, I would not be having this conversation for sort of fear of being fired or what have you, uh, which just goes to show, absolutely, he's censored to some degree, but he's cool. He's cool as fuck. Yeah. I mean, like, he works out. <laughs> yeah. Like, um, he manages, so me not coming from the same background as yourself, like the first half of most of his podcasts, you know, I, I struggle to be interested in like the language. Bro, I'm listening at 3.3 X. <laughs> like when it Prompt comes it. to learning new terminology, like I just blank out. But when he starts, uh, like when he explains the science behind it, uh, I'm just like, I, I don't want to learn like five new words today, bro. Uh, but then when he gets into the part where it's like, here, here's the, uh, you know, the protocols that you can execute to help with this, that, um, I'm very interested in. And of course, when I do have the patience to like, listen to both of them together, he ties them both very well. He, he does the super nerdy science portion and he does the like tips and tricks based on this super nerdy science portion. Um, he does both of those. We, usually you see people do one or the other, but he actually does those two. So it's okay with you, even though you may not fully care about the five terminology, you want him to say that. I want to understand it. Um, 
but yeah, I usually just, I'm happy with just understanding the gist of it. You know, like, um, yeah, I, I can't give an example of some of the terminology, but like, for example, I, I'm not sh exactly certain what a peptide is or, um, you know, what, uh, there, there's, there's things that he keeps it, coming It's ju just a, a protein, but less amino acids. Sure. It, it doesn't I mean, even matter. I know what a protein is and an amino acid, but you know, I still don't really know what that means. Um, which is okay. Uh, it's totally okay. Yeah. Who cares? Uh, but yeah, so what, when it's like filled with that kind of thing, um, it, when he explains like the, the more scientific stuff, I'm just like, I, I don't get it. Um, but you want to get it. I want to, I want to understand in layman's term, like how it all works. Like I, I like to know why, um, you know, if, if I'm going to, for example, wake up in the morning and, uh, make sure there's light and movement first thing in the day. I want to understand why you do. But I don't. So you to... care about the mechanisms? Absolutely. But I'm but... not going to like remember the mm. terminology of like the corneal such and such. Right. That's right. It's impacted or whatever. It's more like, I just want to like understand exactly how that, um, you know, how that works. Uh huh. Does that come from a boosting ego perspective? Like you feel smart so you feel good and so you do the the work because you like feel smart doing it or is it like you believe in it more i think i believe in it more i think it's the opposite of me feeling smart i think i'm a little lazy like it's more like if i trust this person you know and that can just be a feeling um i i will take the lazy path <laughs> and just be like just give me the goods let me understand. Um, it's the same thing with uh, food. I went through a, a period where I was really listening to a lot of podcasts around really? food and like how it affects you and, you know, carnivore versus vegan, oh, all, all these things. Fun. And I found the same thing is at the end of the day, if, uh, if I liked what I was hearing, then I just want to hear, like, just tell me what to do. So what should I avoid? What should I eat? You know, et cetera. Uh -huh. I don't need to understand exactly how it affects the gut biome and the whole rigmarole. Just give me a taste and then tell me what the protocol is. Ah, uh, what builds trust? Uh, I think it's just, it's just a feeling like using Huberman as an example, like it's just likable. Uh, I understand good communication, communication, like ability to communicate, ability to speak in a manner that I can follow like a somewhat of a narrative, you know, good public speaking skills, um, being able to get to a point, being able to have like a theme or a thesis, um, you know, what's been interesting about being in this men's group, mm. um, these are all for the most part, uh, successful men, um, exceptional men to some degree. And, uh, they're all in their like thirties and some are in their late twenties, some, uh, pushing 40, but for the most part, um, but when they're in this group and, you know, you go around the circle and everyone shares, I have been astounded at how all over the place some of the thoughts are like they're it's almost like a stream of consciousness it's like they're not even thinking about what they're saying until they're actually saying it they're not taking like 30 seconds ahead of time and be like what do i want to talk about like what, what how do how am i gonna it's almost like they're having a captive audience because they've got like eight other guys that are there they're not competing with their cell phones like they get that captive audience they take advantage of it and don't even like take the opportunity to like communicate in a way that would allow the other men to give better feedback, mm. ask better questions. Um, structure. So, yeah. So structure is lacking. And you like structure in a video when uh, Huberman is speaking. And cause I, I really, I really like this. Um, basically everything that he's talked about, I understand. Cause I'm like, did this for 10 years in my, in my academic study. So I, I get all of it. But I'm not totally obsessed with the mechanisms. Mm -hmm. Like, like for example, the sunlight. Okay, you, you mentioned sunlight. So what, what he has mentioned many times is there are photoreceptors in the retina that, can, that have the ability to detect the light from the sun, right? And, and that goes to the back of the brain and, 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 you know, the pineal gland is activated and you're like, oh, I need to wake up. 
Or at night when you see sunlight, it's like, oh, melatonin production should start. Now I need to sleep, right? So there are, they're called melanopsin ganglion cells mm -hmm. that do this. Now, for me, I've actually recorded from these cells. N not melanopsin, but just in the retina, I've recorded from these cells and I've literally pricked a monkey's you know, visual cortex and I've gone past these cells, right? So I know what the hell he's talking about. But still, the I'm not totally like, it's not magic for me. Like, I, I don't feel like, wow. Oh, but other people like Martha does. She's like wowed by it. She's like, oh my God, sure. this is cool. What a cool mechanism, yeah. right? It's just a concept is probably a little mind blowing. Right. So I always wonder, because when I read psychology experiments, right? Like for example, the monkey isolation experiments, right? When there's like a, he isolated the monkeys from his mother and then, uh, you know, he kept them isolated for three months. They came back in, into the world and they, they stopped exploring. They were having autistic behavior. They were, you know, crouched up like that. And you see these monkeys. Now, if someone tells me, oh, Farhan, here is the mechanism, right? In this monkey's uh, prefrontal cortex, this oligodendrocyte progenitor cell. Yeah. Like, bro. Yeah. We need to go hug people because they're socially isolated. <laughs> That's what you, matters. You, you give me the meat. Yeah. Right? Like the action of this social isolation experiment tells us that love from mothers are, is important. Love from peer group is important. So go give that love. Figuring out the mechanism. What are you going to do? Make a pill for love? You're going to make a pill to make you feel awake? Yeah, that's exactly what you're going to do. Right? So when I see mechanism, I'm like, oh shit. They're going to try to make a pill out of this. Why else would they study the mechanism? Right? Of course there is a the, the, the scientific stuff, right? Like, oh, God's creation and let me go discover. Sure. There's a lot of scientists like that. But the people who are controlling the science, they, they want to know the mechanism so they can make a pill. It's literally that. Right? So... I don't know, man. I, I have a love-hate relationship with Andrew Huberman because of the, well, one, we talked about the, how, how he doesn't say what he really believes in, right? He holds back. Like, for example, when he's talking about sex, he'll be like species, uh, species appropriate, cult, you know, uh, yeah, country yeah. appropriate, age appropriate. I'm like, really, man? Come on. Like, really? Come on. Give me a break. Like, who told you to say that, right? And then he'll say something like, um, he wants to keep his tenure. <laughs> dude, and it, he'll, he'll say like, uh, 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 you can comment on YouTube. I read all the comments. No, he doesn't. No, you don't, bro. Like, who are you, who are you kidding? Right? So it's like, I wouldn't say that in a video. If, if it was not true, I wouldn't say it. I wouldn't say, like, I don't read my comments. I don't ever read them. I, other people read them. Like, I don't go on Instagram. Other people post on Instagram for me. I want to stay away from Instagram as, as far as I can because I, cause I know what, it, what happens to my brain when I go on Instagram, right? So, um, yeah, but it's very interesting, like trust. Yeah. Is it because he's from Stanford? Does that help? Uh, sure, absolutely. I mean, it's the whole package. It helps that he's attractive. It helps that right. he looks like he works out. Right. Like it it's, helps it's, that he, I love his backstory that he was like a skater brat. And right. that, like, Tech you know, so, exactly. Like, yeah, he's all around cool. Um, and then, yeah, the uh, just the way he explains it. If, if I stay interested and learn something, I have a pretty short attention span. So that's okay. just, that means something, you know. Okay. So yeah, his ability to over. communicate is, is top notch. He's the new authority, bro. Yeah. He's taken over, man. People at the gym are talking about magnesium L3 and 8 <laughs> to, to help them go to sleep. Like, what? Right. Where'd you hear that from? Andrew Huberman. Okay. Yeah. I guess you just believe it, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> wow. Like like a simple example, AG1, Athletic Greens. I don't know if you've ever taken Athletic Greens. No, and I probably would if we like, we get it here in Mexico. But. Yeah. So um, I have taken vitamin D3 from Athletic Greens from like uh, 10 years ago. I used to take, you know, I, I don't do that because I get enough sunlight, so I don't take vitamin D supplements. But... um. One of my uh, coaches at Afro D, Jameson, who lives downstairs, 
he did a very thorough ingredient um, step-by-step analysis of AG1. And he's like, this is an average, this is an average brand. This is average stuff. Like there's no, it's not some high quality shit, right? It's average. Like it's, uh, some of it's organic, some of it's not organic. It's a little bit of this, a little bit of that. It's a big list of things, but there's nothing like majorly cool about this. And Jameson is very objective. Cause like, what does he have to gain? Like AG1 could be good or bad, but he doesn't care. He's very objective. So when he did that analysis and then you got, you know, Tim Ferriss, you got Andrew Huberman, everyone is yeah. advertising AG1 and Andrew says, I take it twice a day, right? Or like thesis supplements or momentous supplements, like all of these, I don't know. I just feel like he's being controlled in a way by these levers. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's part of a system, no doubt. Um, and, you know, he's part of the, the Stanford system right off the bat. And now the bigger he gets, uh, he's part of that. Joe Rogan, Aubrey Marcus, you know, Athletic Greens, whatever. They're, you know, Athletic Greens has a car. They're like Nike, I suppose, of the supplement world now. Like they have a contract with all the big players. Um, and that's how they're doing it. I don't know. I, it doesn't bother me okay. as much. I guess uh, I, I'm head in the sand type of person. I'm like, cool. Uh, just keep making entertaining content. I'm down. <laughs> Got it. Yeah, it's very interesting. But, uh, yeah. What? Can you tell me, like, the mentors, like, your mentors, who are they? Like, maybe Andrew Huberman is one. But can you list maybe eight to 10 mentors that you really follow, care about, listen to? Yeah, I think it's uh, it's a moving target. Changes is never as many as eight to 10. It's more like one or two at oh. a time. Oh, shit, okay. Um, there was, uh, the, aside from Tim Ferriss, I suppose, um, maybe the first person, online podcast person, that really struck me was Aubrey Marcus. Back in 2014, 2015, um, his message, again, him, him being the CEO of this supplement brand, being so successful, being jacked, looking cool, having a book on, on the day, the way he talks, he's like half bro, half like spiritual person. Um, and then he actually started getting a little too spiritual and stuff. And now I can't stand <laughs> hearing him just like, dude, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, but at that time I was, uh, was really feeling his his energy and his vibe. I was like, this is the man. Um, these days, there's a guy called Pedro Sculion. I know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Grant Cardone was the guy for several years. Um, yeah, Pedro's, again, like that, that, he knows how to talk, you know? And all of these guys, for sure, have like a, a masculinity about them. Right. I think that resonates with me. Like if, if Huberman was like a skinny, well, would we person or whatever, like it wouldn't have the same effect. Uh Aha. Yeah. I definitely look up to them as, as like, okay, like, you know, in another life, I would want to be you kind of thing. So if they didn't, if they weren't uh, masculine, um, and successful and, yeah, that communication, I think, is everything, especially when it comes to audio. So. Especially, and also the topic. Yeah. The topic they're discussing. Right? Mm-hmm. Like if someone was talking about physics, or like a Neil deGrasse Tyson, you, you don't care, he's fat. I've, like, I tried to listen to one of his books, actually. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't think it's quite as... So like I've, I've listened to many podcasts and many books from people that were not of masculine or attractive but just talking about like the people that uh, I admire and they kind of stand out as like online mentors. Uh, they certainly all have that in common. Got it. Yeah. And Bell, um, this is uh, the last topic I want to cover. And uh, that's your book, Career Anywhere. And um, I want to tell tell me your journey towards writing mm. and how you've taken your creative process of software and website development into authorship. What was that like when you were writing it? 
How has been the process after writing it? What is the difference between writing something and marketing something? Take me through this. Sure. A lot to unpack there. Uh, the book was written as a response to what I felt was um, the main knowledge that I had. Um, again, like I was mentioning, I would just get hit up by a lot of people on Instagram being like, how do I swing this? How do I get this? You know, this is like 2000, this is before COVID. Um, everywhere I go, I'm meeting people. I'm not doing anything special. I'm just trying to live my best life, work hard, you know, in, integrate the two was kind of my whole thing is not, it's not like work then life. It's like, how do I cultivate a lifestyle that like lifestyle first and then make my work match the lifestyle, right? Most of us do it the opposite. We like choose a job or a career and then we build our lifestyle around that. So I was like flipping it and, um, people felt pretty, uh, like it resonated with a lot of people. And, um, I was like, all right, let me write a book on this for young adults and people that are maybe midway in their career. And they're hitting like a little bit of a slump, kind of like I had gone through. Uh, and maybe they want to, they have like a, an old school traditional job and they want to shift to a remote career, but basically people that want freedom, right? They want freedom of time, location, finances. Um, and for some, and to me, it seemed obvious, like the steps, cause I'd kind of gone through them, but, uh, for many people, it's everything from like, well, well, how do I find something that I'm passionate about to all of that? Um, so I got a ghostwriter. Um, I recognize that I work all the time and there's going to be a massive project. So like, I need to find some hacks for this. So we would meet once a week. I would just unload all of my ideas and thoughts. And then she would, uh, come back the next week with like a chapter. And we went like that for about six months. Um, then once the meat of it was done, um, I worked on it myself, really became a labor of love. You know, it's one of those things that definitely challenging. Um, and it took so long to complete, um, what, once that was complete, then I hired someone to help build the brand and the company career anyway, the whole, it's an LLC. Um, there's other products like a planner workbook. Um, basically it's, it's a whole business and brand and, um, once to answer your question of like, so it took a long time. It took all of COVID. By the time we launched, which was basically late last year, two things, I noticed two things is, um, that I learned from that is I was too slow because, um, and when you do a creative, you embark on a creative mission, you want to be interested in it. You want to be, if it takes so long that you, it becomes laborious, um, and you lose that fire. That's kind of what happened to me. Meaning like by the time we launched it, I felt like there was like so many other people with the same message and the same content. Um, even though if the message is still relevant to me, I had learned and grown so much myself. I had now other issues, like not issues, but interests, like other things I was researching, you know? Um, so it just wasn't as like fun to talk about. It was sort of like old news to me. Um, and then to your last point, um, all the creative stuff had been done. So like all the photography, all the writing, all the website design, all the marketing videos, and now time to build a funnel and do all this stuff that I actually am not that interested in. Um, and it kind of stalled in that it was like, okay, we're good to go, but, um, it's, it's not fun for me anymore. And, uh, it's the, the content is even as interesting. And I just don't want to put in all the effort to like, to market and promote it right now. Um, so I've been letting it kind of like hang out and I've actually just come back to it. Now we're, um, three months into the new year. So it's almost like I gave myself a little break, a little kind of, you know, just to not worry about that now. Uh, and I'm partnering with some people that are going to help with the marketing and advertising and doing all of that, um, 
the 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 stuff that I'm not that uh, skilled at or interested in. I just want to do the creative stuff. I just want to create the content. That's it. Uh, that that's fun for me. You know, like spread the word, send the message, make sure the product is packaged and tied up and makes sense and provides value. Like that's it. Everything else I want to outsource. Um, so I'm getting those wheels turning and, um, and then, yeah, the next step is, uh, convert the book to right now it's a PDF, convert it into uh, an Amazon book, like a uh, soft cover, hard cover, digital download. So it's like an official real book and, uh, yeah, get it out there, get it into the right hands. That's so cool, man. And I totally get it. Yeah. I totally get you because I'm been lucky because I have a f business partner, Imran who took care of all the funnels. Even though I've studied this in detail, like I've saw, seen the VSLs and ads and written copy and like I, I know the work, but it's not what is in my heart. Deep down inside, I don't really care about like this funnel and this ad message and blah, blah, blah. So what basically wound up happening is I told them, look, my interest is this message, bringing out the truth, telling stories, having conversations about important matters that people can get value from. Now, where this will lead, I have no idea. But in my heart, I have the confidence, mm -hmm. right? It's the potential, mm -hmm. right? And I know that, you know, the J Joe Rogan, Andrew Huberman, Tim Ferriss, all the guys we love, right? Jordan Peterson. I can watch these guys podcast like without any break forever. I never get bored because it's like, wow. So, so that the fact that I resonate with it so deeply, I know it in my heart. I know. So, so I, I told Imran, I'm like, look, man, I, I'm going to do this podcast. And, uh, I mean, obviously we're running a company. It's like an international company, 50,000 customers. Like we have to obviously like take care of the company, but I'm going to trust you guys to run with it. I'm going to trust you guys. Because I've done this a couple of times in the past and it didn't always work out. I had to always come back. Like some shit happened. Yeah, so, yeah. Oh, fuck, I got to come back. So now we have a very good team, very dedicated. We fired all the people who were weak, you know, and uh, God bless them and, 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 you know, very, very, uh, you know, best of luck to everyone and lots of love. But we've, we let go of people very easily because if they're weak, they're keeping us down. So now luckily we have a very, very strong team and we've cut down a lot of people just to keep it like fundamental and just pay people more who are very competent. And so, um, yeah, man, it's, it's, it's been quite interesting because I also love the creative work and the exploration of the ideas and the researching of what the message is and what matters to people and what matters to me. And I know that doing the conversations feels so good that I know I can sustain this for the rest of my life. Whereas building a business is not something I care about. You know, like I care about, I, I care about creating stuff and that could be in many, many, many different fields. But the analysis, the technical know-how, the organization, the logistics, it's not my thing. No. <laughs> Me neither, man. So we, uh, I mean, we're in, on, on the same page there. Yeah. Very, very on the same page. Yeah, well, congratulations for being able to build such a tight unit that you're able to step away. Hopefully it works out this time. Yeah, I'm, I'm also very good hope, man, and uh, pray to God every day for that. Uh, no, we're doing well. We're, we have, uh, the team is great, man. They're, I mean, really great people. So I'm, I'm very fortunate, and especially my business partner who said, hey, man, I got it. Do you think? I don't I got it, man. Because look, in one thing that we realized is thought leadership and authority and trust is built through content, not necessarily through some um, product, right? Because if you even if you look at AG1, nobody gives a fuck about AG1. It's Tim Ferriss marketing it that they care about. 
you know, look at a company like Onnit, right? Aubrey's company. I mean, it sold, a, I think, a year ago-ish. So I think it was like a $400 million buy, like $400 million exit, right? And and why? Joe Rogan. Mm. Joe Rogan, Rogan brought, Rogan, yeah. you know, Alpha Brain. Right. He was taking Alpha Brain. He was like, oh my God, I, I had, the, you know, I felt like this. I had this dream. Like, you know, it's Joe Rogan, right? Yeah. Marketing. The, the biggest podcaster in the world. So it's not that people are buying. They're not buying audit. products. They're buying what they think the product will give them based on the trust of the, the message and the person that's delivering. That's, bro, Ali, the, the, the owner of Jungle Gym, he just bought um, some uh, pro, uh, some gut stuff from on it, gut pills. So I was like, hey, man, what are the ingredients? He's like, I don't fucking know. It's like, and this guy is an expert, like a health, he's a, he's a trainer and a gym owner, but he doesn't care. Trust. Trust, yeah. So that was the step back because I was like, look, we can do ads, we can get uh, in front of people, we can sell a bunch of product, but at the end of the day, trust and authority authentically, not some fake stuff, but authentic trust and authority. And, and by truly helping someone improve their life is what we need to do. Because of that, you can sustain forever. Products come and go, right? Products come and go. Yeah, yeah. and that's the, the validation that we all seek. I mean, you get an email from someone saying, hey, your, your message, your content truly changed my life and change the trajectory of what I was doing. Like that's, that's what it's all about. It's, it's contributing. That's it. And, um, Bell, final question for you. What excites you the most? What gives you the most dopamine basically as you see, um, today and the near future as you embark? And it doesn't have to be career oriented or, or any, anything. What in life, what excites you about, about the world? Well, uh, I guess there's, there's big picture and there's currently, currently I'm, I'm super excited about training and getting tip top. Um, I've been, like I said, phoning it in for so long and just kind of doing this like gradual, like not a massive slide down, but just slow slide down. And, uh, just, I've only been back at it for a month, like actually training hard. And you know, I remember when I was young, I used to just look at weights and I would grow. It's not the case anymore. Um, so like after a month, I can see that I need many, many, many more months to just get a fraction of the athleticism and strength that I once had. And that's encouraging. I'm actually pumped about it. That's been like not encouraging in the past, but um, that's what I'm digging the most like right now. That's what's got me fired up is just the concept of, I, I almost let go of the thought of, of ever being like remotely built again. Like, you know, I kind of had made peace with like my peak is behind me sort of thinking. So the, the fact that that may not be the case is uh, pretty exciting. Reminds me of Mike Tyson coming back. <laughs> awesome, man. Hey, I'm excited for you. Thank you, dude. Um, and hopefully we will get a grapple in. I yes. know you mentioned it and we, we were in Playa together, but um, yeah, man, I'm sure it's going to happen. A session here and there. Right on, dude. Anytime, yeah. Would love to feel the the strength and the mobility and <laughs> the creativity of of that and um and also man thank you for coming and traveling here to for this podcast and being vulnerable and going deep into things that may not always feel comfortable and all happy happy right some things were painful and thank you for bringing that out and and for your honesty and love so I appreciate you brother my pleasure. <laughs>